This was nil. I myself operated one case of mucormycosis in uh, COVID-19 first wave. But this kind of peak of infection happened in second wave. The kind of strain we had, which caused immunity to further go down, happened in the second wave. The number of cases which were, I would, uh, you know, uh, quote is sort of mismanaged in a sense that paper, uh, people overprescribed themselves, people self-medicated, people were put on a lot of drugs which were immunosuppressant, be it steroids or, uh, or other immunomodulator drugs or broad spectrum, spectrum antibiotics. Drugs were running in WhatsApp. So thousands and thousands of pa patients were there who were not monitored. And they were patients with diabetes, they were patients with immunocompromised status, they were patients where COVID-19 itself had turned havoc into their body. So what actually happened was a triad of things which let this particular fungus get inside your body. And we know that it gets inside your body by either inhalation, inoculation or ingestion. So the, uh, the main part which uh, is affected is the nose orbit and the cerebrum, which we'll be seeing in uh, further slides. So we know that this is a triad. I've already told about that. And if we are going to tackle this, we also need to tackle the main problem behind this. So I always keep on telling that this is a medical problem. It is not a surgical problem. And this the patient should understand. This is a disease which needs antifungals to kill the fungus. We are not there to kill the fungus. We are there to clear and debride those tissues which have been infected by the fungus so that uh, we get a healthy bleeding tissue and the, blood, uh, and the drug can be absorbed inside. That is very, very important to understand. So whenever you are counseling the patient, you have to tell them, look, what we are going to do is to remove that particular part of disease in your body so that the drugs act properly. So we have a high risk group and I think multi-centric everywhere people are collecting data and at the end of this whole thing hopefully i just keep hoping that this doesn't you know uh, uh, come back again to us this kind of uh, uh, either of the pandemic or mycormycosis does not come back to us again but when they are collecting data some of the common things are coming up that most of them are patients with uncontrolled sugars hyperglycemia or even early uncontrolled uh, sugars early patients who were not diabetic but now their sugars are not controlled patients who have had some kind of immunomodulatory drugs right as i said from steroids to other aspects patients who are very sick who were either on ventilators or on oxygen therapies who were with severe neutropenia who were with high iron overload all these patients organ transplant we all know that and this is the high risk group which we should look for because this has also created a lot of panic in normal patients as well so what happens? Uh, what happens in uh, in rhino orbito cerebral is obviously when mycorrhizae gets inside the body, it turns into hyper form. And I'm not going to go in a lot of details, but when I have to understand the surgical aspect, I also want to know how and where it will affect. So once it is in your turbinate, it goes on to create the whole uh, cycle and a whole picture of RCOM. And if it is inhaled, it goes pulmonary. We are now, you know, uh, I think all with time pulmonary mucor is going to be another problem we have already been treating so many pulmonary mucor in our pulmonary department we have also got gastric mucor cases and cutaneous mucor happens with inoculation uh, they become uh, hyphae they come into blood vessels the angio invade and they invade everywhere so if your main blood vessels got gets clogged you understand that every area will turn into necrosis it's almost like gangrene if you stop the blood vessel supply your limb will go gangrenous similarly happens into the head and skull base area or anywhere in the body so this is cam which we call about covid associated mycormycosis you have impaired phagocytosis you have high iron overload you have all other kind of high risk groups where this fungal gets a chance to grow so this is what happens uh, sorry uh, inhaled fungal spores is trapped in paranasal sinuses your phagocytosis is impaired, it turns into hyphae forms, causes angioinvasion necrosis, and then the cycle starts. Wherein, when we talk about the staging with the, which I have taken from in the Journal of Ophthalmology, and I think ophthalmology has done an, an excellent job in working towards mycormycosis because so many good classifications and stagings have come from them, which has really helped us to manage our patients well. So it spreads uh, in the sinuses, the first thing, it, 
uh, it attacks is the middle middle turbinate and why does it so so if you see this flow which is a computational dynamics flow air flow through the nose the area which is most affected is the middle turbinate area where the laminar flow is uh, maximal there so that is why that is the place where which is affected the most whereas when you ask in mbbs i think so many of us we told black turbinates inferior turbinate no it is the middle turbinate and then from there the ethmoid sinuses skull base inferior turbinate and the major area which is involved which is the reservoir of this disease is the pterygopalatine fossa so when I, as a surgeon, I should know that in each and every case of my mycormycosis, that is the area which I need to open every time in every single case. So mycor spreads contiguous, mycor spreads with angioinvasion, mycor spreads with imboli phenomena, wherein you can have disseminated uh, mycor in the brain. Main vessels. It can thrombose the internal maxillary, thrombose your sphenopalatine, greater palatine, all the important orbital vessels. And I think uh, we already have a talk from the ophthalmology team who will going to explain in a lot of detail regarding the orbital involvement. And I'll not go into that details and not much take up their topic. So that's what I'm going to do. So this one uh, article, which has just come now in 2021 on May 1st, has very nicely elaborated the cause behind uh, mycormycosis, or we call talk about pathophysiology. Uh, I already mentioned how, uh, you know, diabetes is in fall and responsible, how acidotic environment inside your nose is responsible, how, uh, you know, uh, angioinvasion happens, how toxicity happens there, and all the major blood vessels, bone, cartilage, nerves start getting involved. So that is very important as a surgeon to know what's happening inside. So this is one staging which we have also adopted in our SOP. And uh, before I just mention what is the changes, uh, what, how we get to operate them, I need to tell you how the staging happens. So in stage one, right from A to D is mostly the nasal mucosa. Unfortunately, during this wave, we are not getting patients at this stage, you know, because this is a very asymptomatic, sort of asymptomatic. You have very subtle signs. You have just nasal stuffiness, just nasal discharge. Now imagine a patient is recovering from COVID. We know that loss of smell is part of it. We know that sinusitis can happen in COVID. We know that you know patients will have sore throat. So how you expect somebody with very subtle changes to come to you with a suspicion that you know mycor is happening? If we catch them at this stage, the prognosis is the best. Mortality will be as low as you know two to four percent. If you debride them, put them on proper antifungals, believe me, the mycor. Uh, the mortality is less in this particular stage so we assess we know that the diagnostic choice nowadays with availability of mri is an mri it is not a ct scan and that's what we are doing here i know it's an epidemic situation you have to work for workable situations where you if you have ct scan you operate but as a surgeon today i know that mri is the one which gives me all the important information for staging and planning of my surgery Stage two, when all my sinuses start getting involved and uh, where my palate starts getting involved, where my zygoma starts getting involved, when mandible can be involved, your alveolus can be involved. And it is here that, again, slowly my mortality starts getting rising up. So even with a good debridement, I need to explain my patient, look, this is where I need to draw a line that I might not give you a very, very good prognosis. Hopefully, the patient should come out if I'm doing a very good surgery and his own adequate antibiotic uh, antifungals. But again, you know, it'll be in coach that it might go on to the lower side of it. Next comes the orbit. And as I said, uh, the Oftal team uh, today with my esteemed speakers are going to speak about this in detail. When do they consider excentration? When do they consider retrobulbar in, uh, in, uh, injections? So we work as a team. ENT cannot work without ophthalmology in case of mycormycosis. And when I, I'm going to end my talk, I'm going to tell you how our team functions at Ames Patna. So diffuse involvement happens in stage three, and we know that the prognosis be becomes bad stage three onwards. And last is stage four. Uh, do you deny such patients? I don't know. This is a very, very difficult question to answer, but we know with from literature that these patients are not going to do well. We do operate some of the case, cases with very, very localized frontal mucor abscesses, things like that. We do not touch cavernous sinus. We know the prognosis is very bad. We tell them 
that look a surgical treatment is not is something which we we are not willing to do because it's going to be more morbid for the patient so ENT features I've already mentioned it's dryness crusting mild discharge facial pain headache paresthesia you do a nasal endoscopy and realize the patient is not wincing with pain when the endoscope or the suction touches the terminal that is very very classical at times so even with earlier sign, you might get a bluish tinge of your turbinates, but when you touch the turbinate, mm -hmm. patient is not wincing in pain. That is also something which is important. Blood stain discharge, black lesions, these are very, very obvious lesions. So different, different kind of patients are coming to us and you can see how orbit and palate is getting involved. Very sad. Uh, we know that they're already in ptosis, they're all in blindness, they're already skin is getting involved. We know the prognosis is bad. Ophthalmic features, again, I said, uh, we, uh, we know along with ENT features, these are the patients that come with these kind of different uh, SRs, vision loss, eyelid edema, diplopia, and we will be uh, hearing about it more in detail in coming talks. So you diagnose, it's very important to ha ha have a high level of suspicion. Uh, and uh, with subtle signs also, if you put an endoscope inside, that's why nasal endoscopy is something which is very, 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 very important. So you can have as frank uh, SR at this, you can see that the whole of the inferior turbinate, the skull base, the middle turbinate is totally black and charred and necrotic. The septum is already necrotic. And I know that when I'm going to take up this patient, whole his skull base, infratemporal fossa, pterygopalatine fossa will be involved. So what that's what we routinely do. We take up these patients in our mucor clinic, do a good nasal endoscopy, send some tissues for KOH mount. We we send for fungal culture and immediately advise a radiological evaluation, preferably MRI in most of all of the cases. Higher tests, you know, epidemic situation, do you really need them? Most of these patients and most of them are clinically diagnosed very well and radiologically. Most appropriate, why MRI? Because MRI is the thing which is going to tell me whether I'm going to operate this patient by open approach or an endoscopic approach. You know, when I know my orbit is involved and uh, you have uh, a T1 contrast and T2 weighted fat suppressed images very nicely gives you typical, not only sinus involvement, but what we want to look for is perisinus inflammation and inflammation in the preantral, periantral and retroantral area, stranding, fat stranding of those regions. What is happening to my orbital muscles? What is happening to my intra intraconal and extraconal structures? What is happening to the brain? These things are not possible in a CT scan. When I was doing my senior residency, most of the time we were operating on CT and we were just seeing that, okay, there'll be subtle signs, we have to go and open it. Uh, but again, disclaimer, epidemic situation, many times MRI is not possible. We are, we are also operating on CT scan basis. Involvement, marrow changes in the alveolus, very, very important. If you look at this picture in actual, in the last image, if my mouse is available, this is a subtle marrow change in the alveolus. Now I know that that alveolus has to go, that part has to go, it will be mucor invaded. Similarly, if I have open, you can see the badly involved orbit, complete mucor invasion inside the orbit. Vision is gone, ethmoids are involved, sphenoids are involved, pterygopalatine is involved, orbital apex is involved. I need to open up this patient. I need to open and clear all the areas. Endoscopic, I have limited disease. I have done KOH mount, it's positive. It might not be positive in all the cases, but if it's positive, my endoscopy shows the features, my MRI shows the features, I can plan better. So till today, I often tell my ENT colleagues, look, MECOR is a case where you need to do open surgeries for a very good clearance. But since endoscopes now can be, you know, we are well trained with endoscopes, you are doing many other approaches like Denker's approach to uh, reach all those hidden areas, it's very well possible with endoscopic approach also. These are some of the diagnostic tools, I'll not go in details of that. But what is important for me is again this treatment algorithm given by the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, again taken from Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and a part of our SOP, where they have very beautifully divided into possible, probable, and proven RC, uh, ROCM, wherein very categorically we talk about staging. And I have just mentioned this for my own ease and for you all to understand that when it's stage one and uh, one, we would 
still go for an extensive debridement. I always talk about extensive debridement. It's not only just to remove the turbinate, but remove the reservoir of the infection, remove the pterygopalatine area. Just see where that necrosis is landing up. See the median area, see the sphenoid area. Stage two, A to D, you have multiple sinus involvement. You might have the palate involvement. Again, extensive debridement, you can choose either open but you can also choose to do open plus endoscopic. So when you're looking at the skull bits, it's always better to do it in good vision. So if you have an endoscope, well and good, you open it, go to the skull bits area by endoscope, debride everything possible, open your frontal sinuses, and then if your palate is involved, very well remove that. Once structures of orbit is involved, it's here that the ophthalmology team has to take a call and we always work with them. It's their decision what they're going to do with the orbital involvement and we often work together we often operate together most of our ot days are with them so uh, either you do a localized orbitotomy or you know when to do the excentration many such classifications have come and that's why i didn't deal this in detail because i know that this talk is uh, from the ophthalmology society i'm not a person expert to talk about it but i we are also people who work in complete cooperation with the ophthalmology without that complete clearance of disease is not ensured. And we know that even after excentration, your orbital effects is totally necrotic and involved. It's going to the cavernous sign, it's going to superior orbital fissure. What are you going to do? But as much as we can debride, as much as we can put the case, the fungal load down, that's what we can maximum do for the patient. When you have extensive cavernous sinus involvement, bilateral involvement, disseminated, then it's, I always talk about palliative cure in mucormycosis, as I've already discussed before. As I always said, open is something. I have uh, multiple videos of endoscopic, but let me be very frank, it's my busy schedule. I have few of them, which is not in a very good quality because we are using one of the most used up endoscopes for our all endoscopy cases. I'll show you one of the small slides. So this is, you can use various incisions. You can use a lateral rhinotomy. You can use a Weber Ferguson. Important is to go to all the nooks and corner. So you have to remove the maxilla, anterior and lateral wall. You have to take away all the disease from the sinuses and skull base area. And uh, you can do the medial maxillectomy. You have to do the inferior partial maxillectomy. As big cases are one of the cases which we just did with bifrontal craniotomy with one of our neurosurgeons, where the mucor was invading the frontal sinus, if there was mucor abscess. We know prognosis is bad, but we're just keeping our fingers crossed because this was still limited and we are going to keep him on a long-term antifungals. We all know what is the status of antifungals today. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that we really you know, get this solution soon. So this patient had bifrontal craniotomy, orbital excentration, and complete maxillectomy on this side. One of the other patients with mucor was invading the gums and your maxilla. So you open from above, you open from below, you remove the palate. So it is one of the disfiguring surgeries. Believe me, I don't like doing them, but this is what we have to do. It is mentally, physically, not only tiring for the surgeon, but imagine what happens to the patient who is very normal a few days back. So the three areas of clearance is this, which we talk about is the pterygopalatine fossa, but you cannot leave the disease in the soft tissues of the cheek, gums, lateral wall of the nose and maxilla, infratemporal fossa. You have to remove the V2 tunnel, which we call the uh, infraorbital nerve area, clear the vidian canal region, septum, skull base, sphenoid nasopharynx and the palate. Orbital apex is something, obviously when it is involved, you have to remove that area and clear it. So as I uh, come to the end of my talk, that some of the important aspect is, in spite of all our best efforts, you know that there are challenges intra, post, and pre-surgery. And most of them is related to the fitness of anesthesia. Many of my patients have gone on the table and have you know, not been fit that day. So they are all diabetics, uncontrolled sugars, uncontrolled potassiums. You are giving them amphotericin already, uncontrolled toxicity because of that, uncontrolled electrolytes. Cases uh, we had of cardiac arrest, following surgery so they're all covid recovered so you imagine all kind of morbidity can happen to them so it's not a challenge for us also for the medicine team also to deal with such cases we have a step down mucor icu where we keep up all these patients just after surgery so we have been operating uh, since 13th may we have ordered around 50 cases today we'll be doing around 55 total patients around 131 we have discharged few they're all coming in daycare 
till the time when we had uh, AMFO, we were giving for last three days, we are not having amphotericin, we are keeping on posaconazole. So we have a big distribution. Today, just we had a meeting where we are increasing this whole thing into double the amount. So increasing the beds of uh, around uh, 100 beds, we are increasing now to another 200, going to operate 24-7 in four OTs, trying to take down the backlog. Let's hope that it's successful. So ICU, uh, sorry, SOP, which explains all that, a team of IENT, medicine, neurosurgery, everything which, uh, which deals with this case. And that's how we are able to just manage uh, Medical aspects I'm not going to talk about because I think uh, we have a we have a uh, talk regarding that. Uh, we know that this, as I said, it is a medical disease, not a surgical. Without these drugs, even a surgeon is incapable to give them good results. So our data is still in the phase of collection. Uh, might be three months down the line, we'll be finally telling you what happened, what were the factors, what were our mortality. I'm not in a position to tell you today. We are still operating 24 seven, it's, uh, so we are just collecting the data. We know the survival factors in uh, ROCM is, is dismal and it depends on many, many different things as, as varied as whether the patient was having fever or not, whether the patient was, what was the time when you operated them, what was the symptom onset to treatment, uh, what was the underlying disease, there are many survival factors for that. And outcomes, we know that the mortality, if your brain is involved, is as high as 80 to 100 percent. If you are catching them early on, it can be as low as 20 percent or 10 percent. But if your orbit is involved, you know, it's always in the middle that you can have 50 percent mortality. So it depends how well you are managing them. A recent meta-analysis has just come in 2018. Uh, has anything changed? Nothing much has changed even after a lot of things. But yes, liposomal drug has changed some survival benefits in renally compromised patients. That is what has changed in, uh, in rhino or cerebral mycosis. Uh, this just came a few days back. Uh, it has been uh, in mycosis in COVID-19 and a systematic review, which talks about these three three triad of uncontrolled diabetes, COVID and record mycosis. And finally, one of the very interesting things which came as uh, uh, as accepted manuscript in uh, uh, record mycosis is surgery is fundamental for a proper management of this case. You cannot do monotherapy in these patients. And similarly is analysis by emergence of COVID-19 in 18 countries. So believe me, it's not India alone, but yes, why it happened in India, we now are getting sort of a clear picture with multiple centers. So this is what I had to talk about. Uh, if you can give me one minute time, but I have, uh, might be the video is not great, but just, just a small peek, a small video just where I want to show. Uh, uh, is my screen visible? Yes, yes. So just uh, uh, because these videos are long, and I did not have the time to edit them. I'll edit them now, <laughs> but uh, just a small, uh, I hope this, uh, wait a second. So we are opening up all these sinuses and taking out the mucosa and it's a destructive surgery, but uh, yeah. So this is what I want to show. Uh, if I pause it, can you see this video? It is a bit grainy. No, it can In, be seen. Yeah. So this is the area if you see my mouse. So sphenoid is being opened and this is the wall which we have to finally open to enter the pterygopalatine fossa. So in most all the patients, you need to open that area where you have to take down the reservoir of infection. This was a minimal disease. That's what I always say that endoscopic is not meant for extensive disease. And that's what many ENT surgeons have to understand that this mucor mycosis, especially when it goes on to involve the orbit, it's better, uh, you know, you open it or even it is localized orbit involvement, then you can do local debridement from inside as well. So, uh, I, you know, um, if chance permits, I have a YouTube channel, I'll be uploading that Mikor cases and I'll share this link with you all uh, once uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, done with uh, editing them. So that's what uh, my talk was all about for today. Thank you for your time. I, I think I exceeded my time. Sorry for that. Thank you, Dr. Krampi. Um, I'll request Dr. Mary, who is chairperson for this, to take up the questions. And we have panelists, uh, Dr. Sophia and uh, Dr. Siru Raman from JIPMER, Dr. Sophia from ITNC. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Bhagavati. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, 
really appreciate uh, Dr. Bhavana for uh, sharing with us her wow, experience. It, it is a phenomenal number, 131 since May, May 8th, and with a mortality of seven, wonderful. And uh, you know, the indications, which is so clearly mentioned that yes, external approach is one. My concern was, you know, very clearly you have mentioned as many other also have shared that the best prognosis is stage one. Yes. And uh, what can we do to catch them in stage one? Because if you have a third wave, it's yes. going to be a problem. Number two, you know, the, I know everyone are looking into your cases and seeing their uh, predisposing probable factors. But I think, especially centers which have lots of them, you should do a case control study, you know, to see what did these patients, all COVID, all diabetics had, which the a similar COVID non mucor patient had. I think you, there is enough patients you have to look. It is the need, it's a very short and it's a need of the hour. You know, we do not want a similar situation in if there is a wave three. Yes, uh, ma'am, that's an excellent, uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, that's an excellent question, ma'am. And actually you are very, very correct. Uh, what, uh, uh, so part one part, uh, is how can we catch them early? And I think this is where uh, mass awareness is important. As I always said, there are such subtle signs that patients do not uh, come to you at so early. But slowly what I have seen in our OPD also, that there are two group of patients, one of them who are serious, who have come with drooping of eyelids, already third nerve involved. There is a group of patients who is coming with these subtle signs. And I think that way media has helped us a lot. That, you know, we keep on telling them that this is the earliest possible sign. And also the doctors who are treating COVID patients and treating those patients. So when uh, the partial data which I can, I can share with you, many of my patients are not COVID positive on RT-PCR or they did a rapid antigen test. We know rapid antigen is only 50% sensitive. But almost every patient, 95% of them had a febrile episode. And these febrile episodes were followed by indiscriminate drug, drug usage because that time they were all in panic. You know, they were all treated. So a lot of such data are coming. Those kind of patients are you know, now coming to be serious, but patients who are being treated now, this is where a ENT fraternity, as ENT fraternity, I think it's important to tell the doctors, to the nursing homes, to the medical colleges, that why it's important to, to give, if you are giving them steroid, maintain their glycemia. Don't make them immunocompromised because COVID is already going to do that. We cannot control COVID, but we cannot, we can control glycemia. We can control your, uh, you know, indiscriminate drug usage. So at least one thing is this, which has to be followed. The other thing is mass awareness as to when you should uh, consult an ENT doctor, not at the time when your orbit starts getting involvement. A subtle change also should take you to the doctor. The second, which you asked me about the study, we are, we, uh, uh, we are doing study at two levels, one at the institute level and one almost all, this, all the peripheral aims are coming together to form a mucor study group. You very correctly said what was there unique in the patients who developed mucor and in those patients who did not have mucor. So we are collecting that data, ma'am, and our uh, community medicine department is also doing that. And as I said, I said, I think after three months, we'll be having a robust data as to what's going on. Uh, it is still yeah. something, uh, and we are also all of our COVID, because we have dedicated COVID and we are now prescribing about at least certain, you know, how effective, I don't know, but at least maintain the alkaline uh, environment by doing some douching because acidotic environment does cause problem in the nose. Yes. So that's Thank okay. you very much, Doctor. Yeah. Congrats for your wonderful presentation and your explanation to the can i ask a aspects. question can i ask a question yes, go ahead, please. yes dr Ainata. Uh, yeah please. i just wanted uh, taking this uh, cue of early diagnosis which i think is paramount to reduce the morbidity uh, and of course the mortality so i just wanted to know in your experience what has been the average uh, average time of onset in the corona calendar now it has become uh, yeah. a kind of term yeah what so, has been the average uh, thing and what is the last because patients get now this extra scared also that they may get this so yeah. what is the uh, range of timing in the calendar 
so in the calendar which i have uh, for the patients who have been presented to us i have had patients presenting within two weeks of covid of uh, as i would say as i told uh, that many of them are rat negative that is rapid antigen negative but they have had fever two weeks back so this is an average two weeks is something which is there with us but we have had patients who were positive 30 days back one month back and now they are coming so my area my uh, my timeline is around 10 days to say 40 days and in ENT fraternity i think it's coming out to be 10 days to 50 days this is what uh, is in general coming up in the literature but i have also had one patient she's a young girl 23 years old and if you look at her mri her sphenoid bone her sphenoid her skull base everything is gone that girl was not uh, covid positive on rt pcr she had a febrile episode she was given steroids and she came to us within 10 days of presentation with subtle sign of only nasal paresthesia. And when we went for an MRI, it was extensive. We have debrided her, but we know her prognosis. She's just 28 years old. So you are having surprises, but when we talk as a community of ENT fraternity and ophthalmology, we need to understand that we have to, we have to address the bigger problem here at the 80%, what 80% are presenting. So I would say the timeline for me is around 10 days to 30 days, the kind of patients which I have got. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great presentation, by the way. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I like uh, Dr. Shivaraman and Dr. Sophia to please uh, tell us the status in JIPMER and uh, IGMC and uh, at what stage the patients are presenting. Dr. Shivaraman, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Bahamati. Uh, very good presentation, uh, Dr. Kanti, and uh, thanks to Dr. Mary Kuri, and thanks for inviting me. In JIPMER, we are crossing numbers of 100 mucor patients. The proportions are excellently, are equally matching with Dr. Uh, what Dr. Kanti ma'am was telling us previously. Um, we have COVID negative cases, actually around 40% uh, of the cases are COVID negative. I mean, they did not have any uh, symptom of COVID or RT-PCR positive. And around 20% of the patients have a concomitant COVID, like they come with mucor. And when we do a investigation for RT-PCR to take up for surgery, they turn out to be positive, but they turn out to be uh, asymptomatic throughout their time. And the rest 30% are approximately uh, COVID positive either in the past. Um, uh, the timelines were very nicely set by Dr. Kanti. Um, it was exactly uh, seventh day, he starts seeing the peaks, uh, especially the post-COVID peaks. Then uh, around it peaks around 10th day, 11th day, it depends on the numbers are not exactly coming with us right now. And uh, uh, very importantly, we see a lot of patients with sinusitis presenting to us in uh, telemedicine and coming to us and following with the OPD saying that, yes, we are afraid, we are having paresthesia, and we are just actually uh, uh, doing a little more CT scans for these bacterial sinusitis. It's very challenging as for us to manage these particular patients because most of these patients are also COVID positive and uh, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. And one more thing that I want to add is the disease severity. Around 20 to 30 percent of the patients present with uh, orbital involvement. And um, last time, um, uh, in the first way, unprecedentedly, we had a cavernous sinus uh, thrombosis. Around um, around 40 percent of the patients had cavernous sinus thrombosis. That was very unusual for us, but it was not showing any uh, significant odds ratio, any significant odds ratio because uh, the odds ratio though it turned out to be a little uh, higher, but uh, the conference central. The confidence interval of such values are very wide because the sample size is very small. Uh, that percentages are a little smaller. But thankfully, we are able to get those patients in an early stage. And yes, we are using posoconazole as a step-down uh, uh, therapy. Uh, we know the situation of a person, but I personally have not got much experience on posoconazole, though we have started to give uh, oral for most of these patients. And uh, we are at, but we see the disease uh, getting a uh, little progressive even after a good surgery. 
with prosopagnosal, the disease is getting a little progressive. So we are worried about it actually. Though we are, yeah, ma'am, uh, Pranthi, ma'am, you want to say something? No, no, I, I think, uh, you know, just one thing which surgical point of view, it is actually challenging. Uh, what is happening with us is, uh, we know amphotericin and fortunately we had uh, our government giving us amphotericin for some time. For last three days, we don't have. So what is happening, we are putting them on posaconazole and we have done extensive debridement and then you are getting newer lesions. So, you know, you, that's what I say, tell to my patient, like, look, we do not operate under microscope. We cannot just take out every possible small mucord uh, tissues. Uh, so what is happening? We have just done extensive debridement and they are on second week or third week and then you get a new. So the duration of, you know, people getting these uh, residual or recurrent things, this is what is going to be a further challenge. So follow up for, I would warn all our ENT colleagues that be prepared for a very bad follow up. And I tell, tell my PGs like, look, this is, we have operated so many, now the mortality will come. Now you are going to be emotionally so, so sad because these patients are so, you know, this is, this pandemic has not only broken us physically, but mentally, this is going to be a bad phase for another three weeks time. I think it's going to be very crucial. Another three months, how many of them will make it? I'm very, very unsure. Thank you, ma'am. Actually, I wanted to conclude saying that, yes, disease progression has been very challenging for us. There have been most of the patients, uh, admit we didn't discharge any single patient. So, uh, waiting for uh, amphotericin and uh, they are on post-conditional, the disease is progressing. We had to uh, do a sinus clearance, sterical maxillary clearance, as uh, Madam told initially. Uh, there was an orbital involvement, but we thought it was not uh, disturb the orbit. But at uh, end of the day, we had to go ahead and remove the orbit. Patient had orbital abscess and uh, patient developed uh, temporal lobe abscess. So, uh, disease progression has been a great concern for all the surgeons here. And we are doing repeat. Uh, CT scans, repeat MRIs to monitor the disease progression. So that's all from, uh, from my side. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, Dr. Sophia, would you like to add? Uh, hello. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, I am actually the nodal officer for uh, Indira Gandhi Medical College uh, uh, in Puducherry. And you know that now this mucomycosis has been announced as, uh, as a notifiable disease by the government uh, of India, the Minister of Health. And uh, we have to report every case to this Integrated Disease Surveillance Project, IDSP. So currently, I am giving you the numbers what is happening in Puducherry only. Uh, what Shivaraman would have mentioned is uh, in Jipmer, which includes the Tamil Nadu patients also. So currently, the active cases are only uh, around six. And uh, one is in IGMCRA, that is Indira Gandhi Medical, Government State Medical College, and uh, four in uh, JIPMER, one in uh, another private medical college. What uh, the last wave that we saw, we had a case of mucomycosis. She was beyond uh, redemption. She had already developed uh, um, discoloration of the uh, skin over the nose and face and very uncontrolled di diabetes. And uh, she was on a ventilator and uh, she expired. We couldn't do much for her. Uh, now this way, we are actually starting to see few cases cropping up. And uh, these are entirely in the state of Puducherry, which is uh, a very, very small place to start with. It's just a population of around 7 lakh people in which you, uh, if you look at the number of people who are infected with COVID is going to be less. And the number of patients who are going to have uncontrolled diabetes is less. And after which we are starting to see a good number of cases. Now, uh, most of these cases in Puducherry, that is even the COVID positive cases, okay, not the smile cases are uh, being sent uh, home in Tamil Nadu and various other states. But in Puducherry, what uh, they are, they are all uh, screened in this home isolation area. And uh, most of the patients who belong to the high risk category, the old age people are more than 60 years who are diabetic and uh, who have uncontrolled sugars, who are hypertensive, they are all kept under surveillance in the uh, hospital, at least for seven to 10 days. Now, this is wh where we are picking up early cases of suspects of mucomycosis. So that is how we picked up at least two now. And now one of the case actually we picked up the profile is almost the same as what you're seeing a 63 year old man and who's uh, uncontrolled diabetes he had a moderate pneumonia uh, he required this oxygen at the, the beginning uh, stage of his uh, covid 
And then uh, uh, after 10 to 15, 10 days of his treatment for COVID pneumonia is when he started having the swelling of this eye. The, we are all, all the faculty, including our non-medical uh, people, the paramedical, preclinical uh, faculties are all on duty. Imagine all of them from anatomy to uh, orthopedics. So orthopedic surgeons are also doing rounds uh, or also picking up uh, cases. So now this case was picked up by a dermatologist. She said that she's having, uh, he's having a swelling of the eye and uh, CT uh, paranasal sinus was done and it showed some uh, signs of fungal sinusitis. And uh, that is how we took him up for an endoscopic biopsy and that came positive. We have done an endoscopic debridement. Uh, he was put on uh, um, posoconazole because we didn't have amphotericin B. And uh, uh, thankfully, within some three or four days of this posoconazole, uh, actually the patient improved uh, drastically after the uh, surgery. And we uh, received the amphotericin B liposomal from central government yesterday. So thanks to them also. So he's now put on this uh, amphotericin B. And uh, we, we, uh, right now we have uh, two other uh, suspects with the same kind of profile. So uh, once the suspect is confirmed, then they have a, a format. The IDSP has a format in which we fill it up and send it over them. And these people are being followed up. So uh, that is all. That is a story from the Puducherry, which is a very, very small place. And we're still having, and uh, actually here, the number of, uh, in a small state of with this 7 lakh population, we have 7 to 8 hospitals, uh, medical colleges. So we have a very high standard of medical uh, uh, facility uh, in South India. So we have a lot of doctors uh, and uh, patients. You, they can come for, at least we have uh, many people who are looking for teleconsultation. So that point, uh, we are, I think we are a little better off when considering the uh, other states. So that is all that I wanted to say. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sophie. Uh, I request Dr. Christy to introduce the uh, rest of the speakers. Yes, madam. Uh, so let me introduce the other uh, speakers of today's uh, uh, session, webinar. Uh, so the second speaker with us is Dr. Usha Kim. Uh, she heads the Department of Orbit, Oculoplasty, Ocular Oncology, and Ocular Prosthetics at Aravindaya Hospitals, Madurai. And she's the present president of Oculoplastic Association of India. And she was a pioneer in treatment of eye cancers, especially among the underprivileged, for which she started the Ring of Hope initiative in 2004 to raise funds for the treatment of eye cancers. And uh, she is the director of the Allied Ophthalmic Personal Training Program since 2005 in Aravinda Hospitals. This program is accredited by the Joint Commission on Allied Health Personnel and Ophthalmology USA. And over the last five years, she has taken up the additional responsibility of overseeing the growing network of Aravind's primary eye care services which is almost 75 centers currently. And uh, the next speaker with us is uh, Dr. Santosh Honavar, and he doesn't need any special introduction. He's a director of Medical Services Center for Psych Group, a director of uh, Department of Ocular Oncology and Oculoplasty at Center for Psych Hyderabad, and also director of National Retinoplastoma Foundation. And he's the current chief editor of the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and Indian Journal of Ophthalmology Case Reports. He was the former head of the Department of Ophthalmic Plastic Surgery and Ocular Oncology and associate director at LV Prasad Institute. And he's known for his research in retinoblastoma. So, and he is counted among the top 2% of world researchers and among the top 10 Indian ophthalmologists in research. And Dr. Honavar is the only Indian ophthalmologist to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the Honorary Fellowship of Royal College of Ophthalmologists, London, UK. And the next speaker with us is Dr. Neeraj Jain. He's a neurologist from Navi Mumbai in Maharashtra, and he has a special interest in epilepsy, neuromuscular disorders, stroke, and Parkinson's disorder. He's currently working as professor of neurology in King Edward Memorial Hospital. And he holds a scholarship or fellowship in neuromuscular diseases uh, from the Institute de Myology uh, Paris, France, and he's also a traveling fellowship for uh, poster presentation at AOCCN 2009. Member of Indian Academy of Neurology, and he's also a member of 
American Academy of Neurology, Indian Epilepsy Association, and Maharashtra Association of Neurology. And presently, he is very actively involved in managing COVID-19 cases and mucormycosis. And the last speaker with us is Dr. Jay Munchandani. He is the Associate Consultant, Medicine and Intensivist, in Lacks and Gudrani Hospital, Pune. He has been associated with uh, PD Hinduja Hospital, uh, Mahim Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital and Research Center, Pune, BJ Medical College and Sasun General Hospitals, Pune. He also has co-authored a chapter in the textbook of critical care, including trauma and emergency care. And presently, he is actively involved in managing COVID-19 cases and mucormycosis cases in a 75-bedded ICU setup. So that's the list of our eminent speakers for today. So now over to Dr. Usha Madam to proceed with her talk on ocular mucormycosis and surgical management. Can you see the screen? Is it visible? Yes, yes ma'am. And audible. Okay. So, uh, a disclaimer at this point of time. I, I'm. I think we are flooded with ENT surgeons and uh, neurosurgeons, and experts who actually have been handling the uh, mucormycosis much more efficiently. And I think we have a very small role to play, but yet a very significant role to play alongside with our team of ENT surgeons, to whom I am really grateful. Of course, the neurosurgeons. Uh, also play a very, very important role. But what I would like to emphasize uh, in during my talk is how we've handled as a standalone eye hospital, but we've always had the support of the ENT surgeon. I'll, as I'm going through, I'll explain to you how we've managed. So as was very nicely pointed out, it's a new, not a new entity. And uh, we've had this in the past, but only thing I'd like to uh, draw your attention to is in the Western population, it's been one in a million earlier on pre-COVID era as well. But in India, it has always been 14 in a lakh, which is which shows that there has been an increased number of uh, mucor even before the COVID era. And that's why it's gaining a little more popularity as the numbers are uh, proportionately increasing also. And we know that uh, it's uh, potentially fatal. And as was pointed out, the... Earlier, the population who are susceptible, uncontrolled diabetes, I, I, don't, I don't think we can ever uh, overemphasize, but this is a point where we really emphasize that diabetes is a common factor which has been running in all our patients with mucor. And of course, the rest of it are very are common to the ones even pre-COVID era. So again, this has been very well explained by our previous speakers. So I don't want to go into... Uh, the entire details, but what I really want to emphasize is I am in line with the fact that it's been occurring after COVID, but there has been an incidence of mucor in the pre-existing phase, that is even before the COVID was found to be positive, and then it could be COVID-induced as well. Is it hitting the pancreas directly and causing an increase in the uh, blood sugar levels so erratically, uh, allowing the mucor to grow? We don't know. And then we also have an, a group where it's because of the uh, treatment per se, which has caused very high blood sugars, as was mentioned by the earlier speakers. So we don't know the further associations. It's being contemplated and a lot of hypotheses are coming out, but these are just speculations. There's no proven fact yet. What's drawing our attention is it's both vision and life-threatening. And uh, there's been very little evidence in literature apart from sporadic case reports, or you can... You cannot see papers beyond a particular number. It can, it's either singular or uh, most often it's a double digit number. But today we are seeing in hundreds and thousands. It's very unique to India at this point of time, especially with COVID. So we'll have to have our own expertise. And it's so nice that all the disciplines are getting together to see what's actually happening. And uh, as I was mentioning, we have had very little experience with COVID and mucor. So 
uh, treatment is definitely based on the clinical judgment that we all have and all put together, I think there's more wisdom. So as was mentioned, for us as ophthalmologists, it's been a complex and very uh, presentations to our clinic. And you might wonder why an ophthalmologist is getting involved. Unfortunately, the truth is nose doesn't get much of an attention. Only in the recent uh, past that the ENT surgeons who have been undermined in these, in these specialities have surfaced out to be the warriors today. So thanks to the ENT team. But it's only because most of the time it's either vision threatening or eye is popping out or eyelid is closing or uh, there is uh, a lot of swelling that the patients come to us. So fortunately or unfortunately, we are the first to see these patients. And uh, I would like to take you through how it presents in the, uh, as a rhino orbital condition. It's usually a severe pain. These are the, I, I'm talking out of the experience of the cases that have come to us. These are patients who come with us with severe periocular pain orbital pain, facial pain, swelling around the orbit, as you can see in this particular uh, case. It could be either just a localized swelling or it could be a diffuse hemifacial swelling. Discoloration around the eyes with some redness and the discoloration is quite significant. It's just not darkening of the uh, colors and proptosis and people are reporting to us with this scenario at the, at the moment. And of course, ocular motility restriction loss of vision is what brings them instantaneously. Sometimes we just see an isolated loss of vision uh, about which we'll be talking uh, in a while. See, this loss of vision is only because of the optic nerve infiltration directly or it's because of the vascular occlusion as a result of vasculitis. Now, of course, I, I don't think I'll have to go into too much of detail with the rhino part because the ENT surgeons are, do, uh, are going to be speaking about it. And previously, Madam has spoken very well about the uh, part that... Uh, draws our attention. But fortunately, we also get a chance to look at the nose and uh, we see uh, patients coming to us with nasal stuffiness, nasal discharge. Crusting is what we commonly come across. And we do see a few cases of uh, uh, teeth which have dropped out or loosening of the teeth or sometimes ulcerations. These are all the pictures of patients who have reported to us primarily. And of course, when it is rhino orbital cerebral, it's often because with cavernous sinus thrombosis. Yes, I do agree with Dr. Sivaraman, sir. Earlier on, of the 23 cases that we saw in the first wave, we did see a significant number of cases with uh, uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis. Out of the 23, we had seven cases associated with cavernous sinus thrombosis. And that apart, we do have cases with sagittal sinus thrombosis, keratid occlusions, cerebral infarctions, and cerebral abscess. And uh, they do come with, we have patients who come with a bit of an impact consciousness, disorientation, and uh, also with stroke. They do come in a wheelchair, but they don't turn up to a physician or a, a general hospital. They often come to us as uh, because they've lost the vision and there is drooping. And uh, these are patients who go in for a high mortality. So again, I cannot undermine the role of all the disciplines who come together to play as a team we do have all of these uh, in our team and uh, the management principle would be to preserve vision and to pre uh, prevent further vision loss, life salvage. This is what we've been practicing. And of course, you cannot reiterate the fact that diabetic control is the bottom line for all of these situations. And as I was mentioned earlier, radiological imaging plays a very significant role, but I have to put on record the fact that there could be a time lag on presentation, especially when you do CT. And of course, all of us would agree. I don't think we have any uh, contemplation or controversy about the fact that CT is what is preferred at this point of time, because there are a lot of cases and CT is definitely faster. Uh, there may be agreements and disagreements, but what I would like to emphasize is what is feasible is what can be done. And at, at the present uh, context, I think CT is what is being advocated in most of the areas, but what we prefer as ophthalmologists also is an MRI, but it's because of the longer duration that we are not able to go for an MRI. Now, what has been the presentations is you could just have an apical involvement just because of the senile sinus infection, or they could present as orbital cellulitis as in this particular scenario, or you could just have a PNS and a single orbital compartment involvement, usually the medial orbital uh, compartment that is involved. So how did we manage as an eye hospital is what I'm going to discuss now. So we look at what the COVID status is and what the MUCA status is. 
whether the COVID is active, what is the requirement of oxygen, what is the severity on the uh, CT, and is there a, is a, is a patient on the cytokine storm. The MUCA, on the other hand, we look at the diabetic status, is, is a patient on diabetic ketoacidosis, what is the severity of the disease of the MUCOR and is it active or is it a passive? These are the different kinds of scenarios that we oh, uh, come across. When, the, uh, when, a, when we have a patient with RT-PCR positive, proven case of RT-PCR positive, we admit the patient in a COVID care hospital. Fortunately for us, our ENT consultant has converted his hospital into a COVID care hospital and he also does the ENT work that apart. So I think it, we were very fortunate to have this uh, facility right next to our uh, hospital. And so these patients are shifted directly to the COVID care hospital where the management is uh, based on uh, the uh, positivity of the COVID. And uh, I think as everybody knows, I don't think we'll have to go into the details. We avoid steroids apparel and start the patient on antifungal. Now the discussion around uh, the antifungal went to start. Yes, if the patients are unstable and if they are OT, the oxygen dependent patients and diabetes is not under control, please start off doing a KOH mount. Just do a swab from the area of ulceration or from the suspected area. It, you, it may be positive, but it's not completely reliable. People always say that it's better to do a biopsy. But you can start the patient on antifungal even before a biopsy because a clinical suspicion is adequate. This is again a point of controversy, but what we are practicing, we are. I'm just uh, explaining it. We uh, do a KOH mount first, but if it's not positive and if you suspect mucor, we go ahead giving up the patient with antifungal because you obviously know that one dose of antifungal or a couple of doses is not going to kill all the fungus. You will still have some element. And once the patient stabilizes, probably you can uh, avoid biopsy. And then you in stable patients, you do a diabetic control, start on antifungal, do a biopsy and debris. I, mean, I think debridement is done alongside the biopsy and the material is collected and subjected for histopathological examination. And you can do the special stains as well if you really need to confirm, but h &E is more than adequate and whatever is feasible. KOH mount is beautiful if, you are, if it's positive. If not, a biopsy, do a h &E, and then I, I think we, we go ahead and most of our cases, we, uh, we are able to do a uh, biopsy and prove it uh, subsequently. Now, there are a uh, 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 set of uh, blood tests which needs to be done during admission of these patients. And we all know that it's uh, the renal compromise that we dread. So all of these tests are mandatory. And uh, I'm not going into the details of all the tests, but what I really would like to emphasize is baseline. These are the tests that are very, very important. And real and function tests has to be mandated before we start amphotericin B. Now, if it is PCR negative, you do the standard mucor management in a non-COVID hospital, which is our hospital, which is the uh, regular, uh, we can have the uh, eye hospital converted into a non-COVID hospital with the mucor. We have... Uh, separated our wards and we have started admitting these patients. We do the diabetic control along with antifungal and do a surgical debridement as well. Now, I'm not going to show all of these because this is uh, borrowed from our ENT. This is an uh, examination that any of us could do an ophthalmologist and it's a classical case of mucor which you can identify. But uh, what we need to understand is it's the medical management. As soon as you the debridement is done, it's the medical management. What we have come across this, we have started the antifungals, done biopsies and then proven it and then continued with the antifungals uh, after the debridement. And I think it is, uh, I, I, I would all definitely say that this debulks, you reduce the uh, load of tissue there, dead tissue, and then you uh, provide the adequate uh, antifungals. It does help. I'll share with you the results also. So we start off with amphotericin B. You might wonder, is it possible to uh, do with liposomal? We cannot afford, most of our patients cannot afford liposomal. So only lyophilized amphotericin B has been used in most of our patients. Today, I do not have li uh, lyophilized. So we are managing with the minimal liposomal that we have. And patients cannot afford, but we have to subsidize it. And we, have to ma we are managing at this point of time followed by uh, uh, the posoconazole, which was mentioned by Dr. Sivaraman as well. And uh, this is also not very inexpensive. This is 500 rupees a tablet. It's very, very expensive, but that's the only step-down therapy that's been available. 
and we'll have to continue for two, uh, two to three weeks. Now, uh, the amphotericin B, we use the uh, lyophilized one, 1 to 1.5 milligram per kilogram body weight. And uh, I, I'm sure all of you know that uh, liposomal is the best, but we do not have stock. We cannot afford. Most of our patients have already been struggling with the COVID and then they come out of it and then they have to uh, raise money for this uh, set of uh, uh, drugs. So we use lyophilized. It's cheaper, but it has more side effects. We'll have to be more vigilant. We'll have to be uh, monitoring these patients more carefully. But this is the uh, dosage that we uh, provide for the patients. Uh, you will have to ensure that there is adequate hydration and also keep in mind the uh, hypokalemia that could set in. So hydration is very important and the dosage is also very, very, very important. One to two milligram, not to exceed more than that per kilogram body weight per day. Now, uh, the renal function test, we do it on alternate days, electrolytes again, alternate days. And then we also keep in mind the uh, all these tests which have to be done on the, depending on whether the patient is COVID positive or negative. And um, imaging, again, this is another important aspect. If in case there is progression of signs and symptoms, even on my, a maximal medical therapy, then we do a repeat imaging. It, we could, it could either be a CT or an MRI. And of course, after surgical intervention, when the disease is not under control. Now, so how would you manage? I mean, this is how we've been managing amphotericin for about two to four weeks. Since it is not available for four weeks, we've stopped at two weeks. We stepped down therapy is with posoconazole, 300 milligrams BD. Now, if it's not available or if patients cannot afford, we have also used etroconazole 200 milligrams per, uh, uh, BD. And uh, the injection posoconazole was available in between, but what unfortunately happened was these patients end up having thrombophlebitis, so we have to use a central line. So it was very uh, cumbersome to start them on uh, injection posoconazole. So on discharge, after step down to oral antifungal, you do an endoscopy prior to discharge, or at the time of discharge, follow up after two weeks for the blood investigations. And uh, the, the duration of oral antifungals is what is very important, at least for six weeks. But you'll have to give them the counseling regarding any alarming signs or to return if there is any progression of the disease. And you have to do a very good counseling in order to make sure that these patients don't uh, disappear. And of course, the supportive medications, the role of it cannot be under, especially in a patient with gaminous sinus thrombosis, they will be on anticoagulants or antiplatelets. And of course, the other uh, uh, supplements we have to give, provide for these patients. Now, surgical intervention, I don't want to show an ENT uh, uh, surgery to ENT surgeons, but what we normally do is endoscopic guided uh, turbinectomy. We open up the medial orbital wall and then we do a, a nick the periorbita and then we also a, a denude all the dead tissue and then concurrently to subsequently we shift these patients on IV, IV amphotericin and you will have to open up and continuously denude all the dead tissue until we see blood or until we uh, until the patient starts feeling the pain now the other aspect that we've been trying to do is the injection amphotericin about which I'll explain in a while. And of course, you can't undermine the role of sinus irrigation with amphotericin B. Simultaneously, we also do the orbital irrigation with amphotericin B. Now, the dosage for uh, retrobulba amphotericin B is 3.5 milligram per ml. And uh, we can actually, I do not use an anesthetic uh, prior to injection because patients do not in most cases feel the pain at all. So if you use an anesthetic injection, what happens is the, the orbit becomes very tight. But we have given direct injections, direct retrobulbar injections, and sometimes on the area, especially uh, either medial compartment or the lateral compartment, and uh, patients do not feel the pain. You, you are, uh, and they start bleeding sometimes, which will be a point where would, we would stop injections. And Remember that's only injections are only for limited Im involvement of the orbital soft tissue, and it can be given in addition to FES in the mild orbital involvement. And I'm sure all of you know that uh, this has to be prepared with uh, sterile water and not with uh, dextrose. So, excentration, that's a, uh, that's a, 
most controversial uh, subject that we've come across in the recent past. Previous papers show that there's no survival benefit if there is an intracranial spread. So when do we actually do an excentration? Only in uncontrolled cases, if there is an extensive disease spread with necrosis and it's not responding to medical therapy, you have to give maximal medical therapy. Now, why aren't we giving the maximal medical therapy? It's an obvious uh, situation. We do not have enough drugs. We are sharing drugs with many patients and we are not giving the maximal therapy. So what happens is when the necrosis is progressing, then we obviously ought to uh, we resort to doing eccentration. And uh, if there is an intracranial extension, do we do an extension, uh, eccentration? I'm not sure because is there an additional survival benefit? We do not know, but we cannot leave the patient like that. So uh, maybe in these situations, we are uh, justified in doing a uh, eccentration. So in the previous scoring, that is by uh, Shah et al., it says more than 23 warrants eccentration. But I think we'll have to do a clinical judgment before we advocate this uh, massive uh, surgery. Now let's look at some of the scenarios only to explain that we have had various occasions and various types of presentation. So 61 year old, blood sugar was 189, diabetic for two years only, COVID negative, complained with pain fever and vision dropped, RAPD present, restriction of movements. Imaging showed just the apical involvement with sphenoidal sinusitis. So patients present with this scenario, purely in the eye, but with sphenoidal sinus involvement. Newly diagnosed diabetic, only 10 days, 300 blood sugar, presented as COVID negative with complaints of pain proptosis, fever was present, and vision was 618. This, I, I was even surprised that the patient was will come to us with 618 drop in vision, especially in this time. But only because of the pain and proptosis and ptosis did the patient come to us. So imaging showed a picture of uh, cellulitis with uh, extraocular muscle involvement. And uh, this turned out to be uh, mucor. Now, again, the next case was diabetic for three years, COVID positive, five months ago. So this, again, for Dr. Baibavi and Dr. Shivaraman, uh, you were mentioning uh, about the duration. But this patient was COVID positive about five months ago. This, I think, was something which I also came out. It could be one off, an outlier, but still it is possible. Presenting with loss of vision of five months duration. Following tooth extraction five months ago, he had and he had doses one month ago and uh, a FES was done five months ago. So I don't know what happened, but this patient was COVID positive five months ago. And uh, again, it, uh, there was a bilateral CVT as well in this patient. Now, newly diagnosed diabetic seven days with hypertension blood sugar of 600, COVID positive, 20% lung involvement, presented with headache and toothache. Vision was 624. MRI showed mucormycosis, again, with involvement of right frontal and ethmoidal maxillary sinus. But look at it. Even when all the sinuses are filled up, they turn up to a ophthalmologist. 55-year-old female, diabetic 10 years, blood sugar 242, random, COVID positive, Corats 4, complained with of vision loss, restriction of movements, and then you have sinusitis with uh, extraconal extension, premalar soft tissue edema, and no intracranial extension. So this again was a positive patient. I'll tell you why this flow and the pattern again. Now here you have a 68 year old female, diabetic, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, 10 years, fasting blood sugar was 76. And patient was COVID positive, was from the ICU, presented five days after discharge from the ICU, pain, proptosis, there was no fever, RAPD was present, pan sinusitis with orbital cellulitis. 37 year old, diabetic, two years, postprandial 251, PCR negative, Corats 5, PCR negative, Corats 5, IV steroids, and he was on oxygen support, oral steroids, IV steroids, seven days after discharge from ICU, defective vision. There was PL plus RAPD. Again, this was the CT, uh, MRI image, which showed extensive involvement. Now, 45-year-old, uh, diabetes 10 years, COVID positive, presented one month after discharge. Uh, again, very typical findings 
thrombosis of the superior ophthalmic vein and right cavernous sinus. And this is the picture that they come with. 53-year-old female, diabetic 17 years, COVID positive, ICU, steroids, PL plus, RAPD, CRAO. So this again is a different uh, presentation. 30-year-old non-diabetic, history of cold two weeks ago. RT-PCR was negative. I'm sure this must have been a positive case. Vague and occasional headache and facial pain. Examination was all normal. Sugar was 462. Showed uh, uh, sino-orbital myocard with medial orbital involvement. 60-year-old, COVID recovered. Toothache. All others were normal. Imaging showed canine fossa and sinus involvement. So if you look at the number of cases we've had, we've had close to 120 cases between uh, in, in the uh, month of May. Altogether, and if you look at the dates, on an average, we've been having about 9 to 10 cases, except for uh, the Sundays. And if you look at the age distribution, We'll have four cases in the, in the age group of 20. The maximum was in the 40 to 50. And uh, you can see an equal number between 50 and 60 and 60 and 70. Surprisingly, uh, about 70 was much lesser and less than 30 was about four. Now, uh, there were a few cases of bilateral involvement, but there were a significant number with severe loss of vision and a significant number with intracranial extension. This was in the month of May. The diabetic status, 81% was diabetic. And what happened is those who are non-diabetic turned to have blood sugars. So they were not established diabetics, but they turned out to have blood sugars. So uh, uh, what were the important presentations? They had facial pain, headache, toothache in 12 cases, ptosis in 62 cases, proptosis in 63, extraocular motility restriction in 58, fever in 42, nasal bleed in 1. That's the reason why patients didn't turn up to the ENT surgeons, even though it is an ENT problem. So in June, there is a, I mean, you, we had a peak like this on the 3rd June, and we are peaking again on the 7th June. So I think uh, we were a little relieved when it was coming down, but we see that yesterday we had a good peak. So what created that favorable trend for us was early presentations. This is what helped us. That is because of the increased awareness and the media pe penetration. I think we did an extensive job of uh, creating awareness in the uh, and also media has helped us a lot in penetration. I think people have scared. So even if there is uh, uh, redness, now people start asking us questions about could it be mucor. So that's a good trend because it's better to overdo than to ignore problems. And uh, we should, uh, there is a lower threshold for imaging. See, we can help uh, diagnose in the uh, early stages of the disease, especially with vascular lesions, which is what we saw as a common presentation, especially the CRAO. Uh, if they turn up early, obviously all of us know that there is a good prognosis for these patients. So thank you very much. So this is, I'm uh, sharing very openly the experiences that we've had in our uh, standalone eye hospital, but we've been greatly supported by our ENT surgeon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, uh, Dr. Renuka Srinivasan is the chairperson for this session. I think we will uh, go to the Dr. next Elif but then he's a panelist. Um, I thought we least. can go to the next talk and then... Uh, okay, fine, fine. Okay. Ma'am, uh, uh, actually, I wanted one to two minutes uh, to be taken by a microbiologist. So shall I call Dr. Johnny? Uh, if he's ready, you can call him. Otherwise, yeah. we can continue with yes. ophthalmology so that there is continuity. Dr. Johnny, are you there? Johnny, yeah. sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We want to know about this yellow fungus and white fungus a little bit, uh, apart from this black fungus, which is going in the media. And um, uh, is it only mucor or uh, some other aspergillus uh, we are also seeing? 
Yeah, for the past few months, you know, these colors were actually named by the media, I believe, the black fungi. The same mucor was described as a black fungi, which is not correct. It's actually a misnomer. Uh, I, I mean, on the contrary, if you see, we were talking about Kevovich mount. On a Kevovich mount, in fact, uh, a mucor would appear absolutely colorless and uh, it would be transparent. It really doesn't produce any color. When they grow on the media, probably they produce some brown color and they appear. You know, the colonies look like gray. And in our MBBS days, you would have heard about the salt and pepper appearance of these colonies. So they're not black at all. The black fungi are totally different, which cause deep-seated infections like mycetoma and chromoblastomycosis and all that. And all this yellow fungi, which they're talking about, and the white is probably, they are describing the colony itself, maybe. Mucor, they were talking about probably what they meant by saying black was the lesion, not the fungi. So probably it should have been called as the black fungal infection rather than calling it as a black fungi. Uh, the yellow one, I think they were talking about aspergillus. Aspergillus, actually the colonies appear yellow and bright green. So probably that was one. And uh, white fungi was uh, candida. They're talking about candida. So basically all of these fungi are uh, opportunistic fungi. They uh, actually like what uh, Dr. Pranti, when she put up the first slide, uh, it had a sentence which said, you know, these fungi are in the soil and they are on decaying plants and fruits and vegetables and all that. So they, they are actually saprophytic fungi, but when our immunity is compromised, uh, you know, they started growing in mankind. So somebody said, I think, um, uh, recently I read, uh, said that this mucormycosis and this entire fungal um, you know, organisms causing infection of late is because of uh, unholy trinity, trinity of three things. One is COVID-19 disease, diabetes, and uh, uh, glucocorticoid therapy. So these are all the opportunistic fungi, candida, aspergillus, and mucor, and rhizopus, and all of these which are causing infections now. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'll request Dr. Santosh on our sir to please uh, present. Am I visible? Is the screen visible? Yes. Yes. Sir. Okay, I'll go ahead. It's then. burning. Okay, all right. <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to talk about uh, stage-based management of mucomycosis. I think my job has been made very easy by the previous two speakers who spoke very beautifully so, and also share some of our experiences. This was in February 2021 that we collected just six cases from Mumbai and Hyderabad. That's all we had during the first wave. First wave, wave had already tapered down and we, we thought we had the end of COVID. So we could just collect six cases and we never knew that... Uh, we are sitting on something that would uh, finally blow out into a big fire. We have about 1,000, 12,000 cases in India now from March 2021 onwards. And there's a very recent series of about 240 cases published uh, um, recently. These were all from the first wave. So in the first wave, there were cases in hundreds. Now we have thousands. So that's a major difference. Now, these are all some of the series that have been published in the recent past. So when you summarize all these series, what uh, appears is that patients who have diabetes, who have been on corticosteroids, maybe tocilizumab, elderly individuals who had severe COVID infection, who had to be on mechanical ventilation for a prolonged time, prolonged supplemental oxygen, these were the ones who were predisposed to mucomycosis. And it could occur concurrently or during earlier intermediate recovery phase. But why is, has it happened so commonly in India as compared to Western countries? Possibly because India is the diabetes capital. And even earlier in pre-COVID era, we had 80 times higher incidence of mucomycosis in India as compared to the rest of the world. So that is a big chunk. So at least 80 times. So with diabetes being one of the factors that are that is associated with uh, mucomycosis and uh, 
you know, as patients who have COVID themselves can develop diabetes, COVID itself can increase the uh, blood sugar level because it attacks the adolescence of the pancreas, can make patients insulin resistant and can result in new onset diabetes, super added steroids, all these make us more vulnerable. So why does uh, mucomycosis occur in the situation of COVID? There is impaired mucosal immunity, impaired systemic immunity, use of immunosuppressives, associated comorbidities at diabetes, ferritin, all that is fine that we all accept. But certain hospitals such as Ames Delhi and some of the major hospitals in Chennai and Hyderabad report very few cases of mucomycosis despite the fact that they have treated thousands of patients with COVID-19. And those are the ones which stand out to have excellent air quality control in their ICUs, possibly suboptimal air quality control and nosocomial infection is also to blame. So obviously this is multi. kind of predominantly impacts. What is published and what is known is that uh, there is impaired mucosal immunity at the point of entry, that is nasal mucosa and the paranasal sinuses have impaired mucosal immunity in COVID-19. And that is the earliest to happen. So as we get infection with COVID-19, what happens is we lose mucosal immunity, nasal uh, mucosal ciliary function is lost, and it remains so for a very prolonged period, even up to six weeks to three months that is shown. So once there is poor mucosal immunity, mucorails are commensals also in their nasopharynx apart from being in the GIT, they can start proliferating. So that's an endogenous source. Second is exogenous source from the air. Spores are everywhere. Mucosa, muco, uh, mucus spores are everywhere and they can simply get into the system and start proliferating. We recently collected 2,826 cases of renal orbitocerebral mucosis associated Up. But what uh, we see is that the age is slightly lower. Our mean age was 53 years, which is kind of shift definitely from what we knew earlier. The youngest patient in the series was just 12 year old and the oldest was of course 88 year old. So there is the entire spectrum, but it somewhat peaks at 50, which is slightly unusual, but slightly a lower age than what we used to see earlier. This is a peak onset. It peaks at 14 days following COVID-19 diagnosis. This is not the diagnosis of RFCM, but the first symptom of RFCM. The first symptom of mucomycosis occurs, peaks at 14 days from the diagnosis of COVID, and about 44% of them had symptom onset more than two weeks, and 16% of them had symptom onset more than three weeks. So majority of patients, I would say 84% of patients present with symptoms, at least have symptoms, three weeks from the point of diagnosis of COVID-19. So majority of patients is that. But then there are outliers, as Usha was pointing out, we had patients who presented even after three months. 23% were non-diabetics. This is a surprising finding. 21% had no corticosteroid exposure at all. And many of them were home cared, like 22% were home cared. Of course, some of them had one risk factor, not all of them had no risk factors. So about 7% of patients had absolutely no risk factors. They were young, they were home care with no or minimal exposure to steroids and no oxygen. So these are the kind of data that we are getting. And what are the primary symptoms? Top five primary symptoms are shown in this graph. Uh, there is almost an uh, equal distribution between orbital and facial pain and facial edema. So these two are associated with each other. Loss of vision was seen in about 20% of patients, ptosis in about 11%, nasal block in 9%, and rest of the symptoms are shown here. But what you see clearly is that ophthalmological symptoms predominate. You can see any number of ophthalm ophthalmological symptoms, ptosis, loss of vision, Orbital and facial edema, if they have periocular edema, obviously they'll go to an ophthalmology. So ophthalmology is maybe the first point of diagnosis these patients come to. Then what are the primary signs? It actually parallels the symptoms, periocular and facial edema, loss of vision, ptosis, 
crop process. Top four primary signs are ophthalmological. And these cases were collected from ophthalmologists, but these were all part of multidisciplinary teams. These are not the patients who were managed exclusively by ophthalmologists, which is not possible. So the, even in a multi-speciality setup, ophthalmological symptoms and signs predominated. Next, go to why uh, staging. Staging is important to triage these patients, have some, what, kind, some kind of a risk stratification so that the patients can be counseled properly and the prognosis can be explained to them. Triage also helps expedite care. Then you can standardize management. So how have we classified it? We have taken nasal mucosa and the nose as the point of entry and initial point of proliferation. From the nose, it goes through the inferior turbinate into the medial orbit, retrograde through the nasal lacrimal duct or through the lamina papyrisia directly to the medial orbit. Then there is a transpenoidal entry into the orbital apex and also the vascular embolus. So from nose to orbit and then to brain. To the brain, it goes typically through superior and inferior orbital fissure, optic canal, and through the nose, it can directly go to the brain, bypassing the orbit through cribriform plate and also transpenoidal. The third pathway is pterygopalatine fossa, where the orbit is completely bypassed. The lesion goes to pterygopalatine fossa through the foramen rotundum to the midbrain directly. And they, these patients come with bilateral third nerve palsy and they could be vascular embolus, which is non-contiguous. So there is either contiguous or non-contiguous transmission. Either which way we have classified this as uh, based on anatomical locations and progression. The earliest symptom possibly is nasal stuffiness, which the patients ignore because it somewhat overlaps with COVID symptomatology. When you look at these patients with an endoscope, you find an in inflamed middle turbinate. Then the middle turbinate can go on to necrosis. These are some of the pictures from the article that we have just completed writing up. It will come out possibly expedited in a couple of weeks. This is a series that I was talking about, 2,800 plus patients, where you see that initial sign in the nose is all endoscopy driven. At this time, if you do imaging, possibly you will find nothing at all, except that maybe if you do imaging very early, you might still find a black mid middle turbinate and also loss of enhancement of the nasal mucosa. You can see nasal mucosa en enhancing brilliantly on the right side, but on the left side, it is not enhancing. So contrast enhanced MRI possibly is the most important radiological um, evidence of an early mucomycosis, of, apart from, of course, uh, nasal endoscopy. This is again a uh, ischemic turbinate. In stage two, paranasal sinuses get involved. If it is just one sinus involvement, such as ethmoidia, which is the most common sinus to be involved in 70%, that is 2A. These patients may not have any ophthalmic symptoms at all or very minimal. Like this patient has mild periocular edema and mild mechanical ptosis. And all he had is ethmoid sinus involvement. In 2B, more than one sinuses get involved. Ethmoid and maxilla or ethmoid and um, spinoid. This is example of uh, ethmoidal involvement breaking through into the maxilla and the black turbinate. And you can see that the infraorbital nerve Around that, there is and supraorbital nerve area. These are some of the very early symptoms these patients can experience. Now, when the patients develop uh, eschure in the palate, then that is 2C. 2C also means that the patient has diffuse paranasal sinuses involvement. And 2D is unfortunate bilateral paranasal sinus involvement. Actually, bilateral paranasal sinus involvement is more common. About 40% of patients have even asymmetrical bilateral paranasal sinus involvement. But bilateral orbital involvement is very rare. So some of these patients don't progress at least on one side into orbital extension, although they have bilateral paranasal sinus involvement. In the uh, orbit, we have medial orbital involvement, which is the most common uh, location in early situations like the only sign that they have is again on MRI thickening of the medial rectus muscle with a small amount of ethmoidal breakthrough you can see that the ethmoidal uh, uh, sinus wall is bulging as opposed to concavity here it is that is one of the first MRI signs of the orbital inv involvement when the orbit is involved slightly more uh, extensively, the, you find all other signs. 
But then even in early orbital involvement, even in stage 3A patients may have periocular edema, not because of direct orbital involvement, as a uh, secondary uh, sign of necrosis, necrotic process in the ethmoid. He has unilateral telecanthus and there's a lot of necrotic tissue in the ethmoid. That results in kind of periocular edema and mechanical ketosis, but his orbital involvement is very minimal. All that he has is medial orbital involvement. And when patient has diffuse orbital involvement, medial plus fat streaking at the apex, then that is 3B. 3C is either superior orbital fissure or orbital apex involvement. These patients come with just ptosis, sudden onset ptosis with hardly any proptosis, a white eye. That's because orbital apex is directly involved transpenoidally. There is no orbital lesion enough to cause proptosis. This is uh, already an advanced stage. Patient can also come with sudden loss of vision, which could be because of compressive optic neuropathy or central retinal artery occlusion. All this patient has is mucosal enhancement in the maxillary sinus. No orbital mucomycosis at this stage, but a fungal emboli causing or arthritis causing central retinal artery occlusion. This is diffuse orbital involvement. These patients actually may need orbital excentration more commonly than not. This is bilateral orbital involvement. This patient does not have an extensive orbital lesion. It's just an early orbital involvement, but nevertheless, it is bilateral. Those are the those are the orbit. Now, in the parent in the uh, CNS, we have either focal or diffuse cavernous sinus involvement. This is an example of diffuse cavernous sinus involvement. You can see the root here is through the sinuses. The lesion hasn't involved the orbit so much, directly gone to the orbital apex and then to the cavernous sinus. This is a patient. Sorry about that. I'll just go back to it. Yeah, this is a patient where there was involvement of uh, through the pterygopalatine fossa, pterygopalatine fissure through the foramen rotunda. Uh, there was nothing much in the orbit at all. This was this is a, a mechanism that we should be very well aware of because that clearance in that area is very important when the ENT surgeon operates on them. Brain involvement, um, so, you know, infarction, 4C, multifocal involvement is 4D. In our study, we found that a majority of patients are came at the stage of orbital involvement. Half the patients came at the stage of orbital involvement and about a third of patients come at the stage of nose or paranasal sinus involvement. So this is eminently curable, whereas part of orbit is also eminently curable. Coming to diagnosis, the first thing that we do is a deep nasal swab. Of course, if it's a blind nasal swab where you simply go into the nose and take a swab, then you get only 30% diagnostic positivity. But if you use an endoscope and take a swab right at the edge of the eschia, not from the middle of the eschia, because that might be necrotic area, you might not find any organism there, then the chance of positivity is 75%. If you also do a microbiopsy, microbiopsy is just to take a chunk of nasal mucosa, which is evidently affected as you judge on endoscopy, then your chance of positivity is 75%. What do you do with microbiopsy? You can send it for microbiology for sure, but more importantly, you can get a tissue invasion confirmation by doing squash and imprint histopathology and frozen section, which can give you a diagnosis in 15 minutes flat. And of course, KOH and calculus white also can give you a diagnosis in 15 minutes flat. So just by doing a endoscopy guided nasal uh, mucosal swab and a microbiopsy, you're confirming the diagnosis. Suddenly, once you get a histopathology, they go to proven category. It is no longer possible or probable, it is proven. So tissue diagnosis was earlier just to be the most important factor in confirming mucomycosis because there could be a contamination in the nose. But now that has been revised just to say that even if there is clinical radiological evidence, you don't have histopathology yet, you can still go ahead and treat them aggressively. Serology is not very commonly practiced. Paranasal sinus debridement tissue can give a very high diagnostic yield, but at the same time, this is something that you do after clinical confirmation or a clinic early microbiology confirmation. CT scan lags. So what is important is MRI if it is possible and feasible. Given the situation that the patient may still be COVID positive, MRI may not always be possible, but if it is possible, then that is the best thing that you have. So when a patient comes to us, the first thing that we do is an RT-PCR. Even if the patient has passed the 14 days, that is what is taken as cutoff to declare them as uh, 
you know, COVID cured, you still have to do RT-PCR because admission depends on that. If the patient remains RT-PCR positive, then admit with all COVID-19 precautions. If the patient is RT-PCR negative, you can do a RAT and then admit in a critical care unit. So we have categorization based on uh, possible, probable, and prover. Possible is in the setting of COVID-19, if a patient has symptoms of mucomycosis, that is possible. From that point on, you examine the patient, do a scan, and if a patient on clinical evaluation and or on scan has additional features, then that becomes probable. If the patient has no clinical signs at all, it is just a vague symptom that the patient is coming with, Still, you need to closely observe these patients and give supportive treatment. Every 24 hours, you see them. And if they become better, obviously, mucomycosis is unlikely. Because symptoms precede signs and then radiology and then obviously everything else manifests. So symptoms are the first thing to happen in mucomycosis. You give a good weightage to the symptoms. If the patient has symptoms, but no signs and radiology features, you still have to observe these patients carefully. If a patient has symptoms plus signs plus radiological features, you haven't had uh, occasion to do microbiology yet, you haven't had occasion to do histopathology yet, still you have to start these patients on amphotericin B. If a patient who's on observation develops new signs to support mycomycosis, obviously amphotericin B. When you've done everything, radiology plus microbiology and pathology, then that is proven, then you start on amphotericin. So the, our uh, treatment of choice is liposomal amphotericin in full dose, that is 5 mg per kg body weight. 10 mg is reserved for extensive CNS involvement. Amphotericin deoxycholate and lip lipid complex can be used if liposomal amphotericin is not available. And if the patient has a bad renal function, then you can use posaconazole or isovoconazole as initial management. And as you start antifungals, you have to prepare the patient and prioritize surgery. Antifungal as was explained earlier very nicely by ENT surgeon, uh, our goal is to debride the sinus and re remove or debulk as much affected tissue as possible. So if a patient is in stage 1, 2, 3 A and B, then it is, it is predominantly paranasal sinus debridement that you do. You don't do orbital excentration. If a patient has early orbital infect, uh, affection, as Usha pointed out, PUQ, retrobulbar amphotericin B, 3.5 milligram per ml of deoxycholate is the dose. 1 milligram per ml of uh, liposomal amphotericin can be used without anesthesia, as was explained. And go to the area of affection and inject around it not blindly retrobulbar, avoid intraconal injection to so that if the patient has good vision, you avoid optic nerve toxicity. Maximum of seven injections can be given on a daily or alternate day basis. And as the patient improves, you put the patient on step-down therapy with isoconazole or posaconazole. If a patient has patient worsens despite amphotericin B in 72 hours, then you can consider orbital excentration. So orbital excentration is considered in patients after PNS debridement if they're worsening on full dose amphotericin B or if the patient has primarily presented with diffuse orbital involvement with limited CNS disease, then you would again do orbital excentration along with paranasal sinus debridement. But if a patient has extensive CNS involvement, it all depends on if the patient is fit for surgery at all or not. If the patient is fit for surgery, we would still advise orbital excentration. We'll come to the results a little later, along with all the paranasal sinus works that you have to do. Step down therapy is extremely important. What is recommended is at least six weeks to three months, but what is possible maybe is for a month. But what is recommended has to be followed if you really want good outcome. So these are our indications. Diffuse orbital involvement, definitely we consider orbital excentration if it's unilateral, no useful vision no or minimal extension to cavernous sinus, a worsening of orbital component within 72 hours after a first surgery or along with amphotericin. This is how we do orbital excentration. We spare skin and suture the skin doing a transverse blephrography and we can fit them with an orbital excentration prosthesis. This is how the skin lining looks like on scanning. You can see a nice skin lining, the excentrated cavity. 
and rest of the management is uh, again with amphotericin. Some patients, you don't need to do orbital excentration in patients who have minimal orbital component, but the manifestations are mainly because of cavernous sinus and paranasal sinus involvement. You clear that area, give amphotericin, and the patient becomes much better without needing amphotericin. What's the outcome in our large series? This is definite. 41% are alive and regressed. This is also definite. 14% are no longer with us. But what is in the middle, that is about 45% of patients can go either this way or this way. So since we have very early results, we can't really predict how these patients will do in the middle. You know, those who are stable now, those who are already progressing, will they get better? Those who are stable, will they get worse? That is something only a long-term follow-up, at least three months of follow-up or eight weeks of follow-up can tell us. Uh, some of the prophylactic measures, corticosteroids, ICMR guidelines are fine, but what is used in UK and some of the Western countries are very strict guidelines where the dose of steroid is limited and the duration is limited. That somehow we are not able to enforce. Some of the other preventive measures are just an ex explanation of uh, signs and symptoms to the patient and the family at the time of discharge, have a COVID follow-up clinic and uh, also a very prompt ENT and ophthalmology consult if a patient has any of the warning signs and symptoms. We cannot screen all of them because even at this high incidence, as we speak about, the incidence, when you look at the numbers, is very low. Two in 10,000 of all PCR positive patients and one in 1,000 of all hospitalized patients who have received steroids and oxygen. So incidence is one in 1,000. That means if you start screening them, you have to screen 999 additional patients who have nothing to get this one patient in whom some of the signs may be very vague. You know, you may not be able to even pick up those signs, early signs or some vague signs or mixed features. So general screening, screening would be a burden on the system and maybe ineffective. So what has changed in the second wave? Why is this high incidence? Maybe the use of steroids has increased dramatically. That is what something that is coming up. Use of uh, steroids and the incidence of diabetes, possibly those are the two important factors. There's a change in risk profile. This is also striking non-diabetics, non-steroid use patients on no mechanical ventilation developing mucomycosis. That could be explained possibly by the mutated virus itself, causing extreme and prolonged impairment of mucosal immunity. And one more theory that is coming up is mucosal necrosis with secondary fungal infection. Why are we saying this is because some of the ENT surgeons who started screening you know, there, there are ENT surgeons who have started screening in Maharashtra, all patients who are, have high risk, diabetics, poor control, ketosis patients who are in the COVID ward by nasal endoscopy. And they started noticing that they find nasal mucosal necrosis in these patients. That is, that could be part of the COVID pathology. Never look, looked into the nose earlier. Now we start looking at the nose and you find mucosal necrosis. And when they did microbiopsy from the nasal mucosa, they did not find mucor at all. It was just a process of necrosis. So this necrotic mucosa, which is already there as part of COVID, can get secondarily infected by mucomycosis. That is one more theory that is going around. So in summary, I would say that we possibly need to moderate steroid use unless steroid is required for, uh, you know, if, if it's a life-threatening situation, then it may be definitely required. But otherwise, we have to moderate steroid use, definitely avoid steroid use in home care patients, control diabetes very aggressively, be aware of red flag symptoms and signs, Use barrier. Post-recovery patients sh should wear a clean mask so that spores do not get into it. Oxygen doesn't seem to be a cause because once oxygen is passed through any fluid, even if it's dirty fluid, spores cannot get transmitted. And mucor is uh, transmitted by spores. It's an airborne infection. So oxygen hygiene was earlier considered, but it's really not the cause at all. What is very important is a high index of, index of suspicion and a multidisciplinary team approach. What is still not known is prophylactic use of antifungals. Prophylactic use of antifungals is known in the medical world, especially in patients who have had bone marrow transplantation, solid organ transplantation, etc., who have a high risk of mucomycosis. Posoconazole was advocated earlier, but now in this situation, can we use prophylactic antifungals in very high risk patients if we can define one such subset? That is still not known. Uh, rest of the things are slightly hazy at this point in time, and maybe we'll be able to come out with some answers in the next couple of months. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was very comprehensive. Uh, 
I like uh, Dr. Renuka Srinivasan, Dr. Elin Bhadini. Anyway, I, do, I think we are running short of time and uh, mm -hmm. there, was no, there are no questions on the chat box, possibly because actually the speakers were very good. And also we have had a lot of webina webinars on this important issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what one thing seems clear, the uh, pre-COVID mucus seems to be quite different from the post-COVID and definitely it is taking a lot of toll and it seems to be having a wide spectrum, both in terms of epidemiology, onset, as well as clinical features. And Dr. Santosh has uh, definitely clarified a lot of uh, 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 queries on that, but we have a long way to go. A lot is ill understood still. I would like Dr. Um, uh, Ariel Vardhani to say a few words before we go to the next speaker. We, we are running short of time, so we'll keep our um, talk a little short, even the next few speakers. Thank you. Ma'am, you are muted. First, thanks to Dr. Santosh Honover and to Dr. Ma'am, who are my mentors, uh, for giving such an excellent uh, scientific uh, and, uh, and their vast experiences. I would like to ask a few questions, uh, like just two questions. Uh, does this uh, retrobulbar amphotericin B has a uh, any inflammations when we give, sir? Doesn't, doesn't cause, cause any reactions. Well, it doesn't cause inflammation, so to say. It does produce mild inflammation, but what is known as compartment syndrome. Since these are high molecular weight drugs, there can be hydration of the area where you are given the trouble per amphotericin B, and that is more uh, common with the uh, deoxycholate. So if a patient has already undergone a medial wall decompression, it really doesn't matter whether the patient has compartment syndrome or not. But if a patient is kind of not been operated earlier or medial wall has not been disturbed, then that could be a cause for concern. So as Usha rightly said, we don't give anesthesia. These patients don't have sensation at all. They tolerate AMFO very well. And you don't have to inject all the one CC. You simply have to go to the area and inject till you feel that even when you give retrobulbar as residents, we used to give retrobulbar. Now we give peribulbar. You know, we don't inject whole orbit becomes very tense. You inject... To the extent that you know that, okay, eyeball is slightly bulging forward by a millimeter, then you stop injecting because each orbit has different volume um, dynamics. So that way you can control it. Go to the area and inject where there is, where there is infection, not retrovalva, retrovalva. That's, 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 that's one thing I wanted to add. Instead of going retrovalva as a policy, I think you should go to the area where there is uh, involved. Yeah. Uh, when do you expect the clinical improvement? Uh, Actually, in the cases yeah. that we're doing, there's no progression that itself is an uh, uh, yeah. improvement. And then subsequently, in about two to three days, we, see, we start seeing the improvement. Yeah. Uh, there's no progression, number one. And then we see the improvement. There are cases where, where there is no light perception, getting back light perception. And there Excellent. are patients who have improved vis uh, two or three lines, uh, visual acuity also. We have scenarios like that. So you can boldly inject because that's the only option we have at this point of time. That has to be supplemented alongside of the IV uh, antifungals. So we cannot stop the IV antifungals and give the uh, retrobulba. It has to be alongside. As uh, Santosh was mentioning, it's post fes post-medial wall decompression. You open up the periorbit also, and then you, you actually uh, do all these. I think it really works well. And I'm not talking mm. from textbooks. I'm talking out of my personal experience here. So people can boldly use. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. One more thank question you, uh, that in case of CNS extension, do we need the exaggeration? This yeah, is like, so that, that is yeah. something which has come out very beautifully in, in the study that I talked about. But I, am, I cannot confidently say it because the patients have a very short follow-up at this point in time. But what is striking even statistically is that in patients who have CNS involvement, cavernous sinus diffuse involvement or up to 4C, if we do orbital exaggeration, their life salvage has dramatically improved. I can definitely say that, that this is an early trend, but I cannot commit that this trend will show continue to become valid even after say six weeks of follow-up. The only word of caution here, I don't know, I mean, it's again my personal experience, when we do an eccentration in a scenario like this, and if the patient collapses, it tends to not be in favor of us. So we have to be really very careful. Medical legally, we have yeah. to guard. Which doesn't mean we should shy away from it. What I'm trying to say is be cautious about it. 
so we cannot over promise or uh, uh, you know you have to moderate their expectations and also be very open about the outcomes absolutely yeah thank you very thank much you. thank you ma'am thank you sir bhagwati and uh, thanks to the yes, organizing thank team thank you that was really nice oh, thank you ma'am so yeah, i'll request dr neeraj jain from km km hospital he be speaking on cerebral mucor mycosis yeah thanks bhagwati and thanks uh, dr webo for giving me opportunity to talk to this uh, on this topic so after previous talks uh, from the ent and ophthalmology colleagues and seniors i think uh, my job is uh, done very uh, my job is very easy i'm sorry so i would be skipping some of the slides because what i feel that uh, most of the things have been covered by extensive talks from dr usha and dr santosh and i'll be just concentrating on the chief uh, primary neurological things which we commonly see in these patients uh, we already know that uh, mucor and aspergillosis both we are seeing commonly in this uh, epidemic and common infection or co-infection also has been seen in some of the advanced patients apart from the hypoxia diabetes acidic medium increased ferritins uh, there are certain other uh, uh, things which are important uh, from the point of view of pathogenesis because mucor can invade the endothelium and it can cause vasculitis so a large vessel or a small artery involvement is common uh, in pathogenesis of mucor and that sometimes leads to stroke what we need to be aware of that it might sinus infection can lead to cavernous sinus uh, thrombosis because of the valvular semiseri veins running the uh, running this sinus traversing the lamina propria and facilitate the fungal infection of the periorbital tissue orbital apex and cavernous sinus maxillary sinus infection can directly cause the heart palate and ethmoid sinus affection and sphenoid sinus can extend into the cavernous sinus and from uh, invade the carotid artery and from there it can embolize to frontal and parietal lobes the uncommon primary neurological manifestations are sagittal sinus thrombosis epidural and subdural abscesses meningitis usually is rare but it can manifest as obstructive hydrocephalus when there is involvement of the ventricular lining and in our experience it has been uh, very few patients of primary meningitis which have been seen but there the, means clinically uh, because of the you know, mucor in the sinuses that was uh, correlated with the diagnosis of fungal meningitis Uh, this has already been covered i'll just go to the slide because uh, so what is important uh, from the point of pathogenesis is that uh, endothelial receptor glucose regulated protein grp78 and mucoral adhesive spore coat protein homolox these are important from the point of view of the endothelial affection of uh, by the mucor and i think uh, through this uh, blood uh, vascular channels mucor invades the uh, deep structures of the brain and cause uh, primary cerebral involvement clinical features have been covered extensively what is important from the point of view of a clinician or a neurologist usually most of the patients uh, because of this uh, epidemic are coming to the ent and ophthalmological clinics but uh, because of double vision or because of severe new onset headache and vomiting or signs of raised, symptoms of raised icp patient can come to neurologist as a primary specialty it is important to distinguish clinically and probably take the video at the onset of the extraocular movement and movement affection because to track the patients clinically it is very important whether they are progressing the ophthalmoplegia is progressing whether the double vision is progressing to document the facial numbness in v1 v2 distribution is very very important so as to monitor the patient properly in the coming few weeks cavernous sinus syndrome and orbital fissure syndrome uh, clinically we should be able to differentiate at the onset so as to guide the ophthalmology and ent colleagues and obviously from the imaging perspective because imaging may be late in some of the this patients the imaging features may be late and that's why clinically we should uh, document the affection of the extraocular movements and pupils at the onset isolated cerebral mucor mycosis is a uh, uh, usually a rare entity typical presentation usually apart from the 
diplopia facial pain or numbness can be recent onset of altered mental status and in this epidemic of uh, covid covid encephalopathy also is there in few of the patients so it is very important to distinguish between, between the two headache and hemiplegia fever can be present only in 50% of cases patients can be diagnosed as ischemic stroke at the onset but the progressive neurological and cognitive deterioration should prompt further investigation and we should always look for the uh, fungal infection in these patients mri uh, in isolated cerebral mucormycosis can show unilateral basal ganglia mass lesions with diffusion restriction with varying contrast enhancement hemorrhage and perilegional edema an infection may progress rapidly to involve the contralateral basal ganglia sometimes uh, there can be involvement of the cerebellum and the fourth ventricle because of the contagious spread intracranial fungal granuloma is a distinct clinical clinical entity with uh, most of the cases pre covidly also reported from india in our uh, uh, series of patients from km only one or two patients had primary intracranial granulomatous mucormycosis and there was very subtle involvement of the sinuses most of the patient uh, are associated with fungal sinusitis and are and half appear as isolated intracranial infections with no clinically apparent sinus disease aspergillus as well as mucor can cause this intracranial granulomatous uh, lesions ct and mri shows tumor like masses with faint contrast enhancement and surrounding parenchymal edema and frontal lobes are the most frequent location diagnosis i won't go into the details it has been extensively covered in the previous uh, uh, lectures uh, what is important uh, from the uh, biopsy point of view that uh, the non septic hypi of mucorels are susceptible to damage from shear stress and thus tissue grinding may significantly lower the yield of culture therefore homogenization of tissue specimen should be avoided when mucormycosis is suspected so that is the only point which i thought ke would brought into the notice so as uh, dr santosh has already covered uh, that mri is best ideal for optic nerve intracranial and vascular invasion there can be optic neuritis cavernous sinus involvement arthritis even for the strokes diffusion weighted images and uh, t2 weighted images are the most important so mri is always a preferred modality from the neurological perspective when the disease advances to involve the brain i think i management has already been covered in detail uh, usually uh, <clears throat> we are uh, following more or less the same guidelines as dr santosh covered the only uh, thing which i want to cover over here is uh, surgical treatment from neurology or neurosurgical point of view usually there are few indications for neurosurgery in these patients increased intracranial pressure either because of the large stroke or hydrocephalus obstructive hydrocephalus or if lesions are compressing the spinal cord then neurosurgical uh, team has to be involved this also has been covered i won't go into the detail just a few points uh, which have not been covered that posaconazole iv formulation has cyclodestrin which improves the bioavailability and uh, the delayed release tablet the, there is a less bioavailability with food so that's why the ideal treatment would be intravenous for a prolonged period posaconazole can interfere with steroid synthesis pathway so there can be adrenal insufficiency if it is used for a prolonged period of time isovoconazole is a, the prodrug is isovocarium sulfate there is a large volume of distribution with high tissue penetration it does not contain cyclodestrin the clearance of both this uh, depends on the cytochrome metabolism and that's why there can be a lot of drug drug interactions and it has uh, isovoconazole has also been found to be effective in some open level studies the csf concentration of posaconazole are highly variable but then it increases in presence of meningeal inflammation posaconazole can be used as a oral suspension and uh, in around 50% of sinus fungal infection including cryptococcus and invasive mold infections but for the mucormycosis the ideal treatment scenario would be a prolonged iv 
uh, course. The duration of treatment is unknown, usually weeks to months, more guided by the disease process and the sinus and the orbit and the clinical response of the patient. IV treatment, unless there is a stable disease which is achieved, the therapy is continued until unless the risk factor is controlled, complete and substantial radiological improvement. And usually it can last from three to six months. So there have been uh, multiple papers as Dr. Santosh has covered that there would be extensive uh, review of more than 2000 patients, but then there are the small, small papers from every pocket. And uh, most of the uh, talks have uh, given the uh, diabetes, corticosteroid use with a background of COVID-19 that increases the risk of mucormycosis. And I think optimal glucose management and optimal use of steroid only can prevent COVID and, uh, mucormycosis in COVID-19 situation. In our neurology journal, also there is a position paper now on this epidemic of mucormycosis in COVID-19 pandemic. And I think it covers uh, most of the management issues has already been discussed by Dr. Usha and Dr. Santosh. In our experience, we have, uh, so with the decline in the COVID cases, we have converted two full wards of COVID into the mucor wards. Around 80 to 100 patients are presently admitted. Uh, at our place in KEM, the management is headed by the physician and intensivity, intensivist. And uh, usually there is a team of uh, ophthalmologists, ENT specialists, neurologists, neurosurgeons who are looking after these patients. From our uh, Maharashtra Association of Neurology, we have series of 140 patients which are primary having uh, sinusitis with some of the neurological manifestations. The difference of uh, a stroke in non-COVID uh, with mucor and uh, in COVID spread is that uh, strokes are much more common in uh, present pandemic. Usually co-infection with aspergillosis has been seen in some of the patients in which there is a neurological involvement. And teamwork is the most important for this particular disease. Regarding the management of strokes with mucor, there are certain limitations because of uh, COVID issue or because of the aggressive nature of the mucor mycosis. So proper management, in, in, interventional management of strokes is not at all possible in the present situation. So it is usually guided more with the typical medical therapy for the strokes that includes double antiplatelets and uh, statins along with the control of risk factors. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That was Thank very you. concise. Um, Dr. Weber, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I will just, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would just uh, thank you for a very comprehensive talk, Dr. Neeraj. Uh, at the onset, I would congratulate Dr. Santosh Shunabar for an excellent talk and an excellent yeah. paper. Staging, ex uh, that the staging is very important for everyone to read. I would ask a uh, few things uh, to what said. After once the CNS is involved, the, uh, all the current guidelines say that we should directly start with the high dose amphotericin, uh, liposomal amphotericin, that is 10 milligram per kg. Uh, we should not escalate gradually. Uh, that is one. Second thing I would like to bring out that imaging issues. MRI is preferred mode uh, and the difficulty of timing has been brought in. But the biggest difficulty presently is that you need a dedicated machine for the COVID patients. Right. It's usually not available. So you have to go in with whatever is available. In fact, having a dedicated CT for COVID patient is all is in itself is very difficult. So you have to proceed with whatever is available. Third thing, voriconazole anticoagulation. These have no role. And the guidelines say that amphodeoxy is to be discouraged. Amphotericin liposomal is preferred in all the conditions. However, if this is not available or uh, then amphodeoxyculate can be given. And third, uh, one very important uh, uh, Suggestion came from this uh, panel is that in spite of CNS uh, uh, involvement, a very rapid, uh, a very rapid 
and uh, emergency surgery does have a important uh, role in this cases so surgery should not be delayed this becomes right. uh, difficult because of the covid whether the surgeries are uh, available ot is available or not for dedicated uh, covid patients because there is lot of biohazard uh, issues involved and it is really disheartening to say that we consider this this disease as rare uh, one year back and now we are having wards and almost uh, as dr santosh's case series of 2000 and 3000 cases and every ward having 40 50 cases hope right. this uh, covid is also in itself a risk factor and with the removal of the covid the mucor automatically comes under the control but we don't know how much lives it will take and because of this situation i think we are not able to manage the strokes also in the way because yeah. uh, stroke management in mucor is a, again a complicated issue and uh, many times interventions are yes. not possible even if the vasculitis is there or even if thrombus is there you know. so it's a all a complicated issue right yeah thank you very much uh, so we'll move to uh, dr jay kumar will be presenting uh, icu challenges in mucor mycosis Good evening everyone I'm Dr Jay Kumar Mulchandani I'm from Pune and I work at a hospital called Inlax and Budrani Hospital over here uh, is my screen visible to everyone yes so I'll just begin with this picture this is uh, this just depicts someone who's come from the frying pan and who's pushed into the fire and this is what is happening to covid associated mucormycosis or cam patients and this is coming out from a serious illness uh, being on oxygen for a week or so and then getting diagnosed with this dreaded illness of mucormycosis which has got extensive financial and uh, uh, aesthetic complications so this was the editorial which was published in the journal of uh, association of physicians of india in january by dr rajiv suman and dr sunawala which which is which basically uh, highlighted the prevention strategies the management and uh, the risk factors for mucormycosis uh, so we've uh, most of the slides which i'll talk about there is some uh, i mean something has been covered in the previous talks so by and large mucormycosis medical management comes from this global guideline which is uh, given by the european confederation of medical mycology and uh, this is an extensive slide but just uh, go, if if you could see the parts in blue these are the ones which are recommended the parts in pink or red they are the ones which are not recommended or they are recommended against so once we have a suspected or confirmed case of mucormycosis uh, what is recommended early is surgical debridement with clear margins and uh, immediate treatment initiation and what is not recommended is slow escalation of doses so this is what was conventional teaching that is start with low doses and gradually esc escalate doses of amphotericin as per tolerance of the patient but now it is clearly recommended that you begin up front and the drug of choice as we all know is liposomal amphotericin b and the dose should be 5 to 10 micro mg per kg from day 1 and uh, if there is brain involvement what is recommended is 10 mg per kg uh, if there is pre existing renal compromise in ckd patients or in patients who have got a creatinine of more than 1.5 what is recommended is to use iv isavuconazole and iv posaconazole availability may be an issue again over here and uh, what they don't recommend is primary treatment with isavuconazole or posaconazole or primary treatment with amphotericin b deoxycholate but uh, like we are in a we are in a state of national crisis and significant shortage so so clearly beggars can't be choosers in this situation and amphotericin b deoxycholate is repurposed and repackaged to be used in mucormycosis in our country so uh, once we begin the primary treatment we assess the response and if you have a patient who's got a stable disease or who's partially responded then you may choose to step down and step down treatment is recommended with oral isavuconazole or oral posaconazole tablets and if there is someone who is progressing with despite amphotericin b and surgical management then you may choose to go for salvage treatment and this includes iv isavuconazole or iv posaconazole what is not recommended is posaconazole suspension and if you've got a renal patient where you've choose to use isavuconazole or posaconazole up front then the salvage treatment will be with amphotericin b and similarly in case of toxicity with one of the drugs you can choose to the other drugs so what needs to be driven home is in this slide is if we have the drug treatments uh, or the antifungal agents for mucor the ones which actually work are only these three so amphotericin b 
posaconazole and isavuconazole and now we've got some in vitro data for itraconazole which is being used by in india so if you compare candida species with mucor you can see all of these drugs are going to work and compare this with mucor where we got only two or three options <clears throat> so the crux of medical management is early initiation of treatment improves outcome choice of initial treatment is iv amphotericin b and lipid formulation has to be the drug of choice uh, uh, step down treatment is with posaconazole or isavuconazole and salvage treatment is either of the two w with regards to amphotericin b uh, the issue about or, or so so what we know is lipid formulations are the drug of choice and they've got very less nephrotoxicity compared with the uh, conventional molecule but it's not that it's got no drug toxicity even liposomal amphotericin b has got some drug toxicity um, the starting dose is 5 mg per kg daily and can be increased to 10 mg per kg the issue about amphotericin b is the or the or the liposomal uh, molecule is the cost so most patients who are not supported by some financial scheme will not be able to bear the cost of liposomal molecules and the cost will run to about 30 to 35000 per day for only iv amphotericin b for a person who weighs about 50 or 55 kilos compare this with the conventional molecule which is amphotericin b deoxycholate and the dosing is different so the dosing is 0.5 to 1.5 mg per kg roughly we start about 1 to 1.2 mg per kg so it comes between 50 and 75 mg per day for a patient who is about 60 kilos and uh, this so one one vial will come for 50 mg so you'll need to use two vials roughly per day and the iv infusions we've discussed earlier they they have to be used in 5% dextrose and they are incompatible with electrolyte solutions so no ns and no rl and the lines where you're going to be using them so the intravenous cannula or the central lines they need to be flushed with d5 before you start amphotericin b that is another pointer and the final concentration has to be uh, maximum of 0.1 mg per ml so if you're using 50 mg it has to be at least 500 ml of d5 water what is what is what are the drawbacks of using amphotericin b deoxycholate are infusion related reactions so patients who whoever have used amphotericin b conventional molecules most patients will complain of febrile reactions chills nausea vomiting headaches and these are infusion related reactions back in the day amphotericin b was colloquially called amphot terrible because of these reactions they also commonly cause phlebitis and you you'll have patients who will complain of pain at the intravenous cannula and you'll need to change the iv cannula every day so what is recommended is you use a central line or you use an external jugular venous cannulation or you use a picc line for these for for this molecule um uh, other common complication or the dreaded complication is in fact nephrotoxicity so patient who is on amphotericin b deoxycholate is at significant risk for developing nephrotoxicity and what you can do to prevent nephrotoxicity is two or three things which are easily doable in wards one is to give the infusion over a prolonged duration so at least 6 to 8 hours and there are uh, institutions who in fact give amphotericin for over 24 hours and there are papers which suggest that you can prevent nephrotoxicity by this by this uh, way and the other common thing to do is to use salt loading before you start amphotericin b so give 1 liter or half liter of normal saline before you start uh, amphotericin b the other complication is electrolyte abnormalities so that can include hypokalemia hypomagnesemia and uh, hyperchloremic acidosis so that is one thing you need to watch for when you are using amphotericin b and keep monitoring your patients at least every alternate day for nephrotoxicity or hypokalemia it can also cause normocytic normochromic anemia so that can be one of the side effects that you will encounter <clears throat> so once you've got some disease control with your primary treatment and you've got radiological improvement and clinical improvement also then you can choose to step down and step down therapy includes two molecules one is posaconazole which is what is recommended is the gastro resistant tablet and not the suspension so posaconazole delayed release tablet can be used which is 300 mg twice a day on the first day and then 300 mg once a day with food if possible so the other worry about posaconazole which many times is noted or is uh, spoken about is the whether it should be taken with food without food or whether it should be antacids should be withdrawn from the treatment so the gastro resistant tablet at least the company or the the inlet the drug inlet does note that you may give an antacid along with it and it does, does not impair the absorption of posaconazole in comparison with the suspension which is definitely hampered by using an antacid
so oral suspension of posaconazole is not recommended and uh, it is recommended like all as well as serum trough concentration should be monitored however i'm not sure whether any institutes do this trough concentration what the goal is it should be more than 1 microgram per ml so side effects of posaconazole are gi symptoms like vomiting diarrhea hepatitis which is a class effect of all as well as in fact and this is more commonly noted with the oral suspension and close monitoring of transaminitis or transaminases is noted at least is is uh, advocated at least once in 2 weeks or once in 10 days the other rare side effect which can be encountered is syndrome of apparent mineralocorticoid excess so patient of posaconazole for weeks suddenly will come with high blood pressure hypokalemia and this is the patient who is probably developing apparent mineralocorticoid excess and needs to be watched out for the other option is esavuconazole which is again limited by availability and esavuconazole is recently what is what is uh, come in the indian market and the dose what is recommended is loading dose of 200 mg which is 100 mg two capsules every 8 hours for for two days that is six doses followed by 200 mg once a day at least 12 hours after the last loading dose the good part about esavuconazole is that it is free from other side effects which posaconazole is having and uh, the gi side effects are also less and the other good part is that the iv formulation is free from nephrotoxicity which posaconazole can have and uh, one another advantage which can be used uh, with other drugs is that it shortens the qt interval so if you have other drugs which which may have qt prolongation esavuconazole is a good choice uh, to consider as salvage treatment so iv treatment if you are using uh, if if, I, if you are using salvage therapy that means if if there is a patient who's got nephrotoxicity as a baseline who's got creatinine more than 1.5 who's a ckd patient or who's not responding to amphotericin b you may choose to use iv posaconazole or iv esavuconazole and in posaconazole the thing which needs to be watched out the dosing is the same that is 300 mg bd on the first day followed by 300 mg every 24 hours the next day onwards the worry is like uh, voriconazole the worry is accumulation of beta cyclodextrin so it is nephrotoxic and iv formulation has to be avoided in patients who have got moderate to severe renal impairment which is a creatinine clearance of less than 50 and if you've got creatinine increasing while on iv posaconazole you can either choose iv esavuconazole or switch to oral posaconazole the treatment duration this has been discussed by the previous speaker the treatment duration is not clearly known it will vary from case to case but in general the treatment will be about 1 month at least and it will go on for 3 to 6 months based on the the based on the patient's response and if the immune defect is resolved like if you have got a sugars which are well controlled dk is resolved immunosuppression is now discontinued then you can start step down to treatment and or probably stop treatment once you've got complete clinical control over the disease and you've got radiological improvement now what about co- combination therapy or what other treatments can be used so combination therapy of antifungals of using azoles and amphotericin there is no convincing data and in this times of crisis probably combination therapy should not be used to to probably preserve the drugs to be used in other patients at least there was one study in which there was combination of using an echinocandin with amphotericin b but this was only in case of cerebral involvement in a small case series published in 2008 so if you want to use echinocandin along with amphotericin b probably cerebral in cere- uh, cerebral involvement uh, cases who are not responding to initial therapy this can be tried there is no evidence to suggest or in fact there is evidence to suggest harm with usage of defrasirox which is an iron chelator with lipotomal liposomal amphotericin b and uh, like i said posaconazole or esavuconazole with amphotericin b there is no significant survival benefit along with our treatment medical treatment and surgical treatment one aspect which can be forgotten easily is to eliminate a predisposing factor like reversing a diabetic ketoacidosis or make, making sure that your patient has good sugar control or making sure that the immunomodulation is discontinued this these factors need to be looked at simultaneously along with medical and surgical treatments now other challenges which may be specific to icu or uh, to a physician is that these patients who develop mucormycosis are someone who's already received corticosteroids and are immunosuppressed so these are patients who've got a gateway to the, to other infections and they can develop gram negative sepsis which are commonly encountered in patients who are receiving treatment for mucormycosis in icu so these are patients who may need some sort of protection from uh, or good hand hygiene to prevent other infections 
definitely because of extensive oral involvement or palatal involvement the airway can be difficult and intubation can be challenging in these patients because of limited mouth opening so you need to make sure you've got a person who is capable of uh, intubating a difficult airway in cases of mucormycosis who can get compromised uh, respiratory function then other pointer is most patients of covid pneumonia i think the first speaker did point out that most uh, these patients of mucormycosis are coming after the second week of covid so what what is documented is the mucormycosis can come from 7 days into covid up to 40 days that is after muco after covid pneumonia up to 40 days is what mucormycosis can begin so uh, one point is that these patients are left with significant fibrosis so their lung capacity is already reduced so ventilating these patients is going to be a challenge so you can't give high tidal volumes or uh, you will have a case where you can develop barotrauma so watch out for barotrauma make sure the peak pressures and the plateau pressures don't cross 30 or 35 and uh, try and ventilate these patients with lesser tidal volumes to avoid barotrauma then the other point is you need to make sure that the glycemic control is optimum and aim for pre preprandial sugars of up to 130 and postprandial about 150 to 180 to get better outcomes and uh, of course renal involvement is another uh, challenge that you may face which can be because of mucormycosis itself or because of the medicines or the therapeutic approach that you've chosen for so make sure your patients are well hydrated and do uh, regular checks of creatinine and electrolytes to watch out for renal involvement and treat them accordingly luckily most patients who develop renal involvement because of mucormycosis or because of the therapy is re reversible so they will have with uh, one or two dialysis sessions there will be reversal of uh, the nephrotoxicity now as per as far as data in india is concerned many data has been have been shown by previous speakers specific to icu and epidemiology i just want to point out is one paper which was published in 2020 which was an observational study on management and outcomes of mucormycosis is one point is in our population the risk factor which is the main predisposing factor is uncontrolled diabetes in comparison with western data which points out to hematological malignancies as the most important underlying condition which predisposes patients to mucormycosis interestingly about 12% patients this was also pointed out in the earlier talk is 12% patients don't have any risk factors especially those who developed renal mucormycosis mortality rates have have been documented to be about 50% uh, and of course this will be this will be redocumented again once this wave finishes and there's more data which comes in because more number of cases will be published and uh, the other point is presence of comorbid illnesses is associated with significantly reduced survival uh, higher survival is definitely noted with combined medical and surgical treatments compared to those who only got medical treatment so surgical treatment has to be the mainstay of uh, saving patients and patients who received liposomal molecules did better who received the conventional deoxycholate preparations median time to death was about 1 month and significantly longer in patients who who got both forms of medical and surgical treatment this graph in this study they clearly showed that survival was better in patients who got the dotted line which got more uh, which got the combined modalities of medical and surgical treatments so lastly i just want to point out two slides which are coming from the indian fungal infection study forums and these are basically taken in consideration the anti fungal drug uh, availability issues in, in in our country and what point what points they've highlighted is anti fungal prophylaxis is not recommended so that is one thing which need which we need to be away from the calculated dose of amphotericin b should be given from the first day and not uh, escalated gradually drugs which have no role are fluconazole voriconazole echinocandins or fifluorocytosine in fact voriconazole is in fact postulated that it can lead to more mucor cases so that is one drug which we are using in prophylaxis in covid pneumonia patients which need to be this approach needs to be gone away with and uh, combination of antifungal therapy is generally not recommended and there is little evidence in support of combination therapy lastly uh, so they did come out with the guideline to medically manage mucor patients and if you can see the points which they highlighted is diabetes control reduce steroids and discontinue immunomodulators like tofacitinib or baricitinib extensive surgical debridement and medical treatment the drugs of choice are liposomal amphotericin b if it is not available conventional amphotericin if that is not available isavuconazole or posaconazole and one point which they've given over here is if none of these is available what we what we can use based on 
very scanty in vitro data is itraconazole which can be used at a dose of 200 mg thrice a day for 3 to 6 weeks so this is the purpose of this slide and lastly this really exhaustive slide which i'm not going to cover the entire slide but i just want to point out this one section which they've given and they've given misinformation and misleading information about mucormycosis is i think this was discussed by the microbiologists that it is not actually a black fungus so at least in scientific forums calling mucormycosis as black fungus is may not be very accurate so black fungi are different category of fung fungi having melanin in the cell walls it is not contagious so you don't need to have a separate cubicle in your icu for mucormycosis patients and it does not spread from one person to the other uh what these what this forum has highlighted that that it does not spread by oxygenation humidifier and water and they remain in indoor and outdoor environment and the spores enter the respiratory tract in fact by air and uh, like i said no antifungal prophylaxis is recommended for preventing mucormycosis in uh, covid patients lastly just to finish as mucormycosis uh, is a deadly disease and we've got extensive surgical issues and prolonged treatment uh, prolonged financial repercussions prevention needs to be looked at more strongly and in our society uh, myths and superstitions in fact have got more uh, you know there are more people believing in superstitions rather than scientific treatments and there are uh, small villages and uh, grassroots levels where cow dung and these forms of treatment are educated in advocated in patients to prevent covid or to treat covid so and this this in fact is one of the photos of a patient which is circulated in the in social media so what we need to understand is make sure we Uh, bust all the myths so that more cases don't come up and we are able to treat patients scientifically rather than on whims and myths with this i'll conclude my talk thank you very much dr jay kumar i think uh, all questions were answered it was very explicit uh, dr ranjan and dr ikbal are there are you there sir dr ranjan yeah yeah yes. yeah thank you dr jay kumar it was excellent talk Uh, mainly considering the fact that we know the treatment of choice for uh, mucormycosis surgical debridement plus medicine amphotericin B rather than only the medical therapy. I just wanted to know one point from you: How do you manage them post-operatively after the extensive surgery of the uh, you know nasal tract and all those stuff? Do you extubate them uh, immediately, or do you do any tracheostomy sort of stuff? Because after extubation. Non-invasive ventilation or HFNC is out of question in these patients. So, uh, do you extubate or uh, do you do tracheostomy or uh, electively ventilate? So, absolutely, that's a very valid question because, uh, as Sir has highlighted, that NIV and HFNOs are out in these patients because of the areas involved. So, if we've got a patient who's got respiratory compromise and who's not coming on TPs on day one, then I think if he's going to need prolonged ventilation, go ahead with tracheostomy and ventilate them. but most patients what we have encountered is they are elective they are, they plan for surgery and they come up on tps they come from ot and tps we extubate on day one day after tps we extubate the next day and take on oxygen by mask so uh, that is what we have experienced thank you thank you so much well, we have so many doubts but i think we are running short of time yeah. uh, dr jay can i ask one quick question yes sir i am sorry have you seen uh, hyperpigmentation in the amphotericin cases hyper Hyperpigmentation in the amphotericin uh, uh, patients given the amphotericin B. No, so we've not encountered hyperpigmentation, but we've given amphotericin okay. for as long as six weeks in our uh, in this way. And in these three or four patients which we have given prolonged amphotericin B, we did not encounter. One thing which which I really struggle with is the uh, venous cannulation. The central line is one thing what is required. So what we use as a local, uh, you know, sort of jugard is we. Use external jugular cannulations for buying time. So we use that for five to six days instead of the IV cannula. So that is something which can be used in patients who are needing uh, prolonged venous access. Yeah, Dr. Jackman and Dr. Ekbal for medicine. Just want to know what is your experience about the most one uh, the most of the most common electrolyte abnormality which we see is hypokalemia. Yes. Hypokalemia. So. Uh, so what? Uh, so, yeah, so hypokalemia is very commonly seen, sir. I agree with this. so what we do is we just instead of preloading with just normal saline with every patient we are giving one ampule of or that is 20 milliequivalents of potassium chloride as a protocol uh, and then we are monitoring at least alternate day potassiums in these patients ah uh, yeah so it's better to keep it higher than 4 4.5 potassium absolutely better than yeah. absolutely sir. because sometimes it become life threatening actually <laughs> yeah okay thank you 
Yeah, with this, we come to the end of our webinar, and it was a very long webinar, but I think it was uh, involved a great of learning experience. And uh, uh, any comments from any faculty speakers? Anyone want to add something? I, okay. I just have one thing, Bhagwati. I think yes, uh, we have to make it very, very clear that uh, one, we are uh, in a pandemic where even mucor is becoming a pandemic, one. So the clarity for everybody should be that we are short of the liposomal and hence we are using what is available. That's the lyophilized version of yeah, it. Right. So I think uh, that has to be really uh, the uh, crux of the thing because when we talk about ideal and versus what's practically possible, I think we are facing the situation and that's the reason why we are using the compromised version. So that's number one I really want to emphasize because being theoretical is different and being practical is different. And when you're facing challenges like this, this is what we come across. And we cannot hide the fact that we are losing lives when it is critical and that has to be emphasized to the patients. Because I do, rem I mean, we are facing situations where when we refer a patient who's come for an eye examination and we refer them to a higher center where there is cerebral involvement, then we are, uh, I mean, there is a lot of issues. So, and also, I don't think we will waste time keeping the patients when there is a cerebral involvement. It has to be immediately escalated to an ICU setup or whatever neurosurgical setup, which needs to be. And of course, posaconazole, again, it's very, very difficult for access for everybody because it's not, again, cheap. So that also has to be emphasized. So... I just want to uh, keep this thought process in the audience alive so that people are not uh, assuming things. And please believe it or not, every day more than uh, doing surgeries or more than providing treatment for the patient, it's very difficult for us to access the drugs. We have to keep track, we have to titrate the doses and it's easy for all of us to feel that, yes, give the maximal therapy. But please remember, it's not available. That's when we put them on interim posaconazole and try to get the maximum therapy. And uh, I, I'm sure everybody's facing the same. Only thing is we are not voicing it out clear and loud. I, I hope everybody agrees. And I'm, I, I, I just uh, want to thank all of you for being very open about what the situation is. And uh, thanks, Bhagwati and Renuka, madam. Thank you very much. You've been there. Thank you, ma'am. I think you did did uh, you are very forthright it's not just the it's availability of the drug the toxicity it's a second battle after the covid battle this is a second battle and uh, as somebody said frying pan to the fire and um, i i hope it doesn't come to a stage when the treatment or the disease original disease gets worse i mean the better of the complications the complications outsmart the disease but it was an excellent thank you very much Yes, madam. It was an excellent session with all of you uh, being here because we also know what you're going through and what we have to do. And it's very clear. Thank you very much, Bhagavati, for organizing it. And thank, you. thank you. Bhagavati has done a good job. Yeah. And uh, thank from you, the time of the conception to this, we've had about 10, 15 webinars on this topic. But we are not, it, I think it's the kind of um, subject of the day. Yes. And sharing always helps. I think being open and sharing all the experiences really helps. And it's nice of all of you to have shared your experiences. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Kranti. I think she's not there. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Ushka, ma'am. Thank you, Santosh, sir, so much for sharing your experience. Thank you, Renuka, ma'am. Thank you, Mary, ma'am. Thank you, Ranjan, sir, Dr. Vaibhav. Thank you, Dr. Iqbal. Thank you, Dr. Johnny. And thank you, Dr. Alil Bhattani, Dr. Sophie, Dr. Shiv Raman. Thank you, Dr. Jai Kumar, Dr. Neeraj. Uh, it has been a really busy schedule for you. You took the time out and for this webinar. But thank you to the team SIPLA for helping us organize this all. Thank you to all delegates who joined the meeting. Thank you to the executive committee of the Pondicherry of Kalmyk uh, Association as well as Scientific Society of the PIMS. Thank you all. Have a good day. Goodbye. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe.